Oh, hello. Hello, Dr. Beckwith. Beckwith, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm here. I was late. I apologize. I'm right here. Uh, okay, good. I actually could you hold on then? I, I, because I uh, we we took a five minutes break, waiting for you. Uh, so could you hold on for a couple of more minutes before you start? Unfortunately, your your slot, your time will be shorter ready to accordingly. Be, uh, yeah. hold so on you a should you please take the take this time right actually to think what part of this uh, of your presentation you you would. Be able to. Yes, I already see. have my. I already have my thing open right now. I already have it open. All right, good. Uh, so, could you please share with us your screen and yes, do I'll share a the couple screen right now. Start. Okay. And please put Time your camera step analysis. on. Do you see it? Oh, uh, uh, hold on. Yes, I see. I I see a screen. Uh, please uh, uh, make it. Uh, make it full, make full screen view. Yeah, I gave you full screen view. Do you see it? Oh, well, it's not full screen, I'm afraid. What? At this moment. Uh, try to press Control L or something. Okay. Uh, I, it says I'm screen sharing right now. Yeah, yeah, you're screen sharing okay, but the problem is that uh, perhaps you can, you, I don't know which uh, uh, which program you're using, uh, but I would like you to make it full screen because we see all this, you know. Uh, I made it full screen right here. It's control. Why don't you press Control L? Control L. Yeah, it's usual makes. I it. did. Oh, because oh, you you are in a kind of a browser. All right, okay, it doesn't matter. Uh, uh, could you please also uh, could you please also switch on your switch on your camera so that we can see your face? Oh, you want to see my face? Oh my God, of course I look we so do. ugly. I look so ugly to begin with. But if you want to see my actual face, uh, well, see my well face? I mean, you oh don't need, you don't have to. But I, I, oh, okay, it's you see me right now, which is I look like I'm five thousand years old. <laughs> Okay, good. Okay. Well, I never did like my face. All right. Anyway. Anyway, let's, uh, look, let's uh, I think it's a good time for you to start. Uh, as I said, uh, because uh, because you start late, uh, I'm afraid you still need to finish by 9.50. So you have 15 minutes for your presentation. Plus That's five fine. That's no problem. I don't have a problem with that. All right, great. So please stop. Okay, presenting. Okay, presenting. Uh, I'm trying to get the presenting uh, different types of starter inflation using Kuiper density matrix for the use of flaton determining different conceivable time intervals of time flow analysis and gravitational waves. Okay, we're using an article by uh, you. I'm seeing this. How do I get rid of this thing? Right over here. Do you you see my full screen? Yeah. All right. Yeah, I got you down. So all right. Now here we go. We use in the book toward quantum gravity. It's an article by Klaus Kuiper. It's a quantum gravity interpretation density matrix in the early universe. Is a one loop approximation with unflattened values uh, using the Padamon values. We can return to scale. We can expect if the scale vector is a initial times t to the uh, to the gamma. Uh, uh, power from early times. We isolate up, uh, presuming the exceedingly small initial time step candidates, initial time values, which are from a polynomial for time values use a Kuiper density value. The gravity wave analysis concludes our uh, article with a flat on uh, decay. All right. So here we go. Introduction. Our first goal is to obtain by a Kuiper density functional can bunch of candidate minimum time steps, which will be for the purpose of giving input into an uncertain principle of the form, delta E, delta T, uh, proportional to four H bar. Whereas the candidate for a density matrix uses H squared right over here, and I'm using this in flat time. And so then what I came up with that H squared divided by phi dot is proportional 10 to minus five. We're making use of the following from four for a one loop approximation. This is Opus from uh, Kuiper, which if we isolate out, this is a, 
isolate out. What I was able to obtain delta E right over here. And we'll apply uh, equation four to explain delta T for their time step applying equation one. We're going to be applying uh, we're going to be applying equation one in order to come up with some information. Understand the import of equation two, three, and four for delta t. So this set we had three pi it was the square root of two, and put this in in two, three, and four. Two, three, and four. And then, which is is that there was that loss of generators. We zoomed this and set uh, gamma equaling. I mean that symbol as a probable density value in equation four, we then have this following type of approximation. This is from equation four right over here. So if we use that, then what we are going to be doing is we're talking about interpreting, uh, if we come up eventually with derivations, there's a minimum time step at delta T equaling to this type of a parameterization, one minus four gamma, plus or minus three eighth NP, uh, this is Planck mass to the fourth power divided by B naught. Interpreting uh, equation nine in terms of the effects it has on equation one. We have to consider what uh, this symbol may or may not be the core, the derivation of equation four is dependent upon having the following. Uh, quote, the quantum gravitational scale of infl inflation is calculated by finding a sharp probability peak in the distribution function of chaotic inflationary cosmologies driven by a scalar field with large negative constant uh, of non-minimal interaction. In the case of the no boundary state of the universe, this peak corresponds to the eternal inflation, where the telling quantum state, it generates a standard inflationary scenario. The subplanckian parameters of this peak the mean value of the corresponding uh, Hubble constant H 10 to minus MP is quantum with delta H over H 10 to minus five and the number of inflation or equal these N are found to be in good uh, correspondence with the observational status of inflation theory provided the coupling constants of the theory are constrained by a condition which is likely to be enforced by the quasi supersymmetric nature of the subplanckian particle physics model. And that is a very uh, serious consideration. So we're looking at what we're kind of saying, well, we're really going to be looking at, we have that delta T, we're going to be uh, devolving the delta E equaling to this type of a formation. The, for, the consequences for frequency signals is as follows. Now here is the mass. And <clears throat> this is what you come up with a so-called, uh, this is what you might call, we make an estimation at the width of the wave front of a de Broglie wave, which may be a consequence of a signal as well as the position of the phenomena of generation of the graviton. We have to refer to the following motivation of length of graviton and mass and other such concerning heavy gravity. And so you have N squared equaling to this, and that would come to 2.74635 times Planck mass. The inflaton mass is, is, is 2.7463, uh, you know, times uh, Planck mass. And this is starting value of inflaton mass is say something like T equals 3.9776 Planck time. Well, the consequences of this, because I really have run out of time, is that making use of the idea of a non-zero probability density of the masses of some particle within the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics in the vicinity of the Big Bang. Well, the idea is, is that this result, 18, is from uh, Karen Fries. And the idea is that if you come up with steps, it's something like a delta T, within the parameterization of delta T, which you would get what I did earlier, is that you probably have, this is a criteria, she said, if the density were of this value, you could have a bunch of Planck size black holes would be broken up to say in the percentage, something like a delta T proportional 3.97 or something like that times Planck time. 
And what you would get is what you would get in this situation is the following. I'm going to read it to you right here. It's, it's future uh, cosmological observations point to a particular and flat on potential for which our universe is not generic on a canonical measure that would shed light on even higher low. So it's a circumstance we're told that our universe is tuned on a non-generic uh, trajectory from the point of view of the classical measure. This would uh, indicate the importance of intrinsically quantum gravitational processes or some ultimate theory of initial conditions. So what I have been referring to, and I'm going to go back to this right over here, with respect to chosen of that uh, particular function right over here, is when you would go back a little bit further, see this delta of t, which I came up right, right over here, this delta of t, this is 3.97 times Planck time. That's one of the values. That's a smaller one. The other one could be up to as large as 10. But you have, it just depends upon the sign, plus or minus, right over here, and this type of a ratio right over here, delta of t. Go from there. <coughs> and <coughs> then I'm going to come to my conclusion. The conclusion is, is that in that delta of t, if you have that delta of t, that would lead up to a threshold. This is uh, Karen Fries's, uh so-called minimum density, which you'd have in the vicinity of expansion of the universe when you really got started for the breakup of primordial black holes. And so really saying that you're picking an interval of delta T where this equation 18 may have some sort of actual import in terms of the uh, physics. And uh, I don't have very much more to say than that because I ran out of time. I hope at least that that's uh, understandable to you. Is it? I've outlined the main point. Giovanni? Oh, I, it, well, I don't know, let, let the audience say. Uh, well, uh, perhaps you actually, perhaps you actually conclude your, your talk with a couple of sentences and then there will be the question time. So this, what you said could be discussed. Okay. okay. Uh, can I? I'm, I'm having trouble again. I tried to keep it as short as possible because I was late. You understand? Uh, sure, you have still five minutes, so you can use this five minutes the way you want. All right, that's fine. All right. Now, what I'm saying right over in, what I'm saying right over in here, what I'm saying right over in here is you come up with a macroscopic scale, which you come right over here, this isolation out uh, to say different time steps, this equation nine would be actually in particular relevant. I have to get, I have to get this thing out of the way. It, has to, it would be relevant toward a regime of space time in which then is that one could use what you might call equation 18. And this is, if you have a breakup of primordial black holes, when would that perhaps be happening? So as I said, is that this is what, and this is from Karen Fries. And she used actually, what she, and she used actually Luke, uh, and she actually used uh, uh, string theory in order to come up with this result. But the idea though, is that you would have a critical you would have a critical density in which then you would have the initial configuration of black holes would be broken up. And so that's equation 18. So the delta T, the interval of time delta T after the beginning of nucleation of the universe would delineate a time in which you might be able to see the effects of equation 18 start to really kick in. If they started to kick in, that would have an effect to say upon what type of uh, generation of signals you would get from the early universe. That is the conclusion of my talk. I had more to say, but I ran out of time. Is that okay. enough? You can ask questions. Yeah, all right. So so that's the end of your talk, right? Yes. You okay, good. Thank you very much for your nice talk and uh... 
Do we have some questions? Please ask questions if you have them. So please raise hand if you, if you if you want to ask question. Okay, I hope I didn't annoy you. I'm sorry. It just what happened was with the black. I was in black holes, and what happened was they had a black. I mean wormholes. And what happened was with it, they had a speaker who was 10 minutes late. Mm -hmm. That's what happened. I see. Well, this session is and, exactly uh, on time. Yeah, well, I can't hurry them up. All right. I have more to say, but I gave you the basis of it right here. Equation 18 is a criteria. For when you would have was your primordial black holes would be broken up by the density of the initial phase of expansion of the universe. And this is something that Karen Fries came up with. And so my entire point, though I should have stated it very explicitly, and I didn't, but I'm saying it right here, with a come up, what you said, you might have a delta T being plus or minus, you might be able to come up with criteria, other things, or when would you perhaps have equation 18 start to have effect? And this is called the breakup of black holes. And uh, that might generate entropy or some sort. And so then I went to that question of how valuable or how valid is equation 19, you know, in terms of generation of entropy. So that's another part to it too, which is, is that the breakup of black holes would generate a certain degree of entropy. So when you see equation 18 as a result of delta of T, when you see an equation 18 as a result of delta of T, then what you would see in the situation is that you would have a breakup or primordial black hole structure in at least the initial phases so that you could have, for example, a comparison with that generation of small particles or whatever it is in the beginning with this functional formulation of uh, acid. So what I really was asking for in the talk was, first of all, can you have a situation which you have some sort of generation of entropy? I was trying to come up with a criteria. Secondly, I was talking about you had delta of T. You would form a criteria for the formation of delta T, the, a delta T interval in which then you might have the beginning of the generation of entropy. So then if that's true, how much fidelity does that have with respect to this very classical formula? This is from Cobe and Turner. So really that was the point of my talk. Okay, I guess you made it, uh, you made it completely clear what was the point. And I think that's gonna be actually, I think it's a good, good point to end it. Uh, uh, perhaps if there are some questions, there is a couple of seconds for you to uh, to raise your hand. Well, since there are no questions, I thank you very much for your- Well, for, what I'm going this. to do is it, just remember my email of rwill9955b at gmail.com. All right. And have anyone send email, complaints, observations, questions, as I can answer it, I will. Secondly, everything which I told you, which I am a terrible presenter, I am the world's worst presenter. I, I freely admit it. Hands up, I'm the world's worst presenter. Is that um, I should have just simply has said, Delta T, would you come up with, when do you have this breakup of the black holes? This formulation by Karen Fries, and she has it in it, and she has it in it's a Springer result, and I cite it. And when does that say or something like that is the result which you get infidelity with equation 19, which is semi-classical and other things to sort, but which is, is it what I was citing in terms of the Kuiper density argument and or what you might call the Hawkins, you know, other things to sort, is not really uh, semi-classical, it's something else. It borders in the lines of having some quantum information. So that's what it is. And so that if you allow me to turn in something for the conference proceedings, I am going to be super explicit in what I just told you. Do you understand what I'm saying? This will be right in there so that no one can miss it. I'll say it in that language. 
Okay, good. Well, I mean, you're, you're of course, uh, invited or welcome to, uh, to contribute uh, your, um, your work to the proceedings of the conference. But I think now I'm afraid your time is running out. So thank you. Thanks again for your uh, Thank you very much. If you don't want my conference proceeding when I turn it in, that's no problem. People have accepted or, or refused and playing your time, no problem. But I'm telling you what my basic idea is, and it's respect to these two equations, 18 and 19, and then going up to what it was, was this uh, drive by I'm, I'm, I'm really sorry, but I'm going to be off, so you shut me off. Well, I will not shut you off, but uh, it's time for, for the next speaker. So thank you very much. Okay, that's fine. I'm exhausted. And please, not you. Uh, please unshare your screen so the next speaker can do it. Thank you very much for your consideration. I really appreciate your gentleman. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you and uh, have a good summer. Take care. Thanks. All right. All right. The next speaker is. Uh, uh, the next speaker is Vasil Todorinov. Uh, I think, I hope you are with us. Uh, Andrew, could you please unshare your screen so that we can, uh, so that we can continue? Uh, I all oh, right. Okay, good. Uh, so Dr. Todorinov, yes, uh, I see your screen. However, I cannot hear you. Could you say something? Hello. Hello. Perfect. Okay, good. Uh, it's uh, the time is. Uh, let me see. The time is nine fifty-five exactly. Just please start as usual, 20 minutes plus five minutes question time. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you for the uh, uh, opportunity to speak here. Today, I'm going to present a work that we did with Saria Das and Pasquale Bosso on effective field theory from relativistic generalized uncertainty principle. Um, a brief outline of my talk. I'm going to very briefly introduce uh, uh, minimum length and and how it relates to quantum gravity, because uh, probably everyone uh, is here, uh, uh, has heard of this already. Uh, then I'm going to discuss uh, some general generalized uncertainty principle ideas and how did we extend them to relativistic framework and then how that led to a quantum field theory with uh, minimum length. And finally, I'm going to summarize and discuss some future expansion of this work. Um, as we all know, most theories of quantum gravity uh, predict some sort of either minimum measurable length or some sort of other scale in, in the universe. Um, in string theory, for example, it's the string length. In loop quantum gravity, we have the expectation value of um, the position uh, of the length operator. Um, so we have many, many examples of minimum length propping up in quantum gravity. How do we study this minimum length phenomenologically though? Well, this is where uh, the generalized uncertainty principle comes into play. Uh, the, this uncertainty principle that you see here is per, uh, derived by just considering a Heisenberg microscope in which the particle and the photon interact uh, with uh, Newtonian uh, potential. Uh, as you can see, we can, we can no longer make the uncertainty in position arbitrarily small, slow, uh, small by making the uncertainty in momentum arbitrarily large. Um, and since we modified the uncertainty relation, this will lead to the modification, uh, modification of the position momentum commutator. Uh, this uh, modification of the uncertainty relation is supported uh, through fixed angle scattering of closed strings, um, thought experiments, including black holes, and uh, many, many other experiments, which will take me too long uh, to, um, to list uh, now. 
all well and good, but we have two main problems with, with this construction. First, the minimum length given by uh, this, um, uh, this construction. This construction works in non-relativistic quantum mechanics, and the minimum length it gives is uh, not a Lorentz invariant, which means it is frame dependent. Uh, therefore, this raises a question. If it is frame dependent, there must exist a frame in which uh, minimum length, minimum measurable length is truly minimum, which effectively brings back the concept of ether um, and uh, it's not uh, good. Further, to realize this sort of commutation relation, most of the time we need to modify uh, the momentum operator. A modification of the momentum operator will result in modification of the, of the dispersion relation, uh, addition of higher order momentum terms, which in turn will lead to um, the energy and momentum operator not summing up li linearly as they should. I should mention here that work has been done and there is um, models which suggest nonlinear composition laws, which solve the composition law problem. Um, uh, but in this work, these um, nonlinear composition laws were, were not necessary. So how do we uh, extend relativistically the generalized uncertainty principle? Um, first, something that is uh, both the case in GUP and RGUP is the fact that we modified the, the uncertainty relation, we modified the position momentum commutator, which means that the position and momentum operators are no, no longer canonically conjugate. Uh, this uh, means that we need to introduce a new set of canonically conjugate auxiliary variables, P naught and X naught, through which we will express our physical position and momentum. Um, the way we uh, obtain these expressions for the position and momentum operators is by uh, assuming that the position and moment, the physical position and momenta are general functions of the auxiliary variables. We expand it into Taylor series and then applied conditions uh, to the expressions. For the position uh, operator, I required it to be isotropic to don't have a preferred, uh, preferred direction, uh, which left these, these two terms. And the, the, the momentum space, I wanted it to not be deformed and eigenvalues to be well-defined uh, and eigenfunctions to be a delta functions in momentum space. Therefore, the commutator between two position operators needs to be a, a zero. That, that's why the position operator is only function of P naught. And then we took the, the commutator between position and momentum. And uh, this is the general expression of quadratic uh, relativistic generalized energy principle that we uh, we found. A more interesting result is that the position position commutator is no longer zero and it depends on the, the, Lorentz, uh, the Lorentz generator. Uh, this, will, uh, this raises an interesting question about what symmetries does this space time have? And that's what I said to find next by um, uh, constructing my Lorentz generators and calculating um, the Poincaré algebra, which we know represents the symmetries of spacetime. Um, the first thing you can see uh, here is that in parameter space, there exists a line in which the Poincaré algebra for RGUP and uh, the, the spacetime with a minimum measurable length is the same as the unmodified uh, one that we uh, are used to work with, working with. Further, on this line in parameter space, we still have a minimum measurable length represented by the position and momentum commutator down here in red, and uh, space-time is non-commutative. So we have a non-commutative space-time with minimum measurable length and the same symmetries as um, the symmetries of the usual theory. 
Um, and this addressed the two, the, the two problems that I mentioned before, um, a fully covariant uh, form of the commutator means that with uh, the, the commutator keeps its form uh, in every uh, frame, uh, which means when we evaluate it to get the uncertainty principle, we'll get exactly the same minimum length in all uh, frame of reference. Furthermore, uh, this uh, Lorentz group that you see here has the physical momentum squared and the pauli lubanski vector as a Casimir invariance. They commute with all the operators in there, um, which means that our physical momentum is generator of translations. And because we know the Casimir invariants are connected to the dispersion relation, we know that we have a quadratic uh, dispersion relation which means our physical positions and uh, our physical momenta and physical energy sum up linearly, uh, which was good news. So how do we translate this to a quantum field theory with minimum length? Uh, we start by fixing the model. Um, unfortunately, uh, we were not yet ready to work with the full non-commutative space-time because uh, the commutator actually depends on the Lorentz generator, which was it, it's something new. Um, so we were kind of forced to uh, make the, phys the physical uh, position to be equal to the auxiliary position. And in that case, uh, the momentum operator takes the following form. This is uh, standard. This is uh, the relativistic um, GUP, uh, that res results in, uh, comes from these position and momenta. This is um, the particular Poincaré group that we, we, we found. Um, you see that there, there is some um, modifications, uh, mainly the um, momentum Lorentz commutator is, and Lorentz Lorentz commutator is scaled with the, with the Casimir. And uh, what is more important, when we take the irreducible representation of this Poincaré algebra, we have exactly the same irreducible representations as uh, the unmodified Poincaré algebra. This means that this, the, this theory uh, correspond, uh, and its corresponding equations of motion describe the same particles as the usual, usual case, that we have particles with spin zero, one half, spin one, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, because uh, we know that the dispersion relation is uh, connected to uh, the Klein-Gordon equation, we, we, fi we find the equation of motion for our scalar field. And from here, we can derive uh, a modified version of the Dirac equation as well. So we have the equations of motion we, we need for, for the different fields. Now we need to recover their Lagrangians. And for that, we use the Ostrogatsky method, uh, which provides a method for working with higher derivative theories. Uh, we, we had to reverse engineer um, uh, the, the method because the method provides a way for you to get uh, the Euler Lagrange equations from the Lagrangian, but with some uh, guessing the most general form of the Lagrangian and then comparing the Euler Lagrange equations to the equations of motion that we get from the Poincaré group, we were able to fix the Lagrangians um, with minimum length that um, uh, we have. These are the particular uh, Lagrangians that we arrived at. This is, uh, as you can see, these, these are the, the usual uh, case plus uh, correction of uh, fourth uh, order in, in derivatives. Um, there is a, there is uh, one concern that we had is the Ostrogatsky method leads to an unstable theories, uh, also known as Ostrogatsky instability. Um, however, when we take these Lagrangians and we um, find the corresponding Hamiltonians, we see that the Hamiltonians are positively defined 
and therefore do, do not contain Ostrogratsky instability up until the Planck, uh, the Planck scale. So our theory, these, these few theories that you see here are good up to the Planck scale. At the Planck scale, we have, uh, we have a problem because the theory breaks down and it uh, contains, uh, uh, it's unbounded from below. From uh, the equations of motion and the Lagrangian, uh, we, we were able to find the propagators for our fields. Um, the interesting thing here is that now we have, instead of the usual two poles um, in the Feynman propagator, we have four different poles in momentum space, uh, which makes uh, the, the derivation for the retarded and the advanced uh, propagators uh, quite a challenge and actually very, very interesting, uh, but I don't have time to discuss it now. And now we get to the meat of the paper. We took the, the fields and minimally, minimally coupled them, uh, the scalar and the spinor field, coupled them to the gauge field and expanded it and were, were able to classify the, the resulting vertices in terms of the, the fine structure, con the powers of the fine structure constant and um, our GUP parameter. Uh, as you can see, our theory are, is very, very rich. We have vertices involving uh, two scalar and up to four gauge bosons and vertices involving two fermion and up to three gauge bosons. Um, for the phenomenological purposes, uh, we, were, we focused on these two. This is uh, the main um, contribution and the GUP corrections to the main contribution. Uh, as so the first two in the second table as well. Um, so what we what we did next is uh, with armed with the vertices and the propagators, we were able to find um, the the cross sections for uh, uh, electron muon scattering in term, in the scalar and the the, the spinor theory. It is interesting to see that when we're talking about scalar fields, the best chance that we have for detecting uh, quantum gravity um, uh, effects or effects from minimum length is for the backscattering, uh, where the cosine is equal to, to minus one. And therefore we have uh, the, uh, uh, the full force of kind of the full force of the correction which is proportional to the total energy of the fields. The result for um, the, the, the Dirac field was even more interesting because we were able to show that the corrections actually are proportional to the sum of the, the, the masses squared, which means that we can take these field theory and model very heavy particles giving us the best chance of detecting um, uh, effects coming from minimum length. And uh, the total cross section for the electron muon scattering, uh, the, the corrections, the re relative corrections depend only on the masses of the participating particles, nothing else. Um, which means that we, we can have lower energy experiments with high, high mass uh, um, particles. And this will give us best chance of detecting um, some kind of minimum length effects. Uh, we didn't stop there. We of course needed to apply it to existing experiments. For uh, this, we chose um, the xenon-xenon uh, scattering measured in ATLAS. In CERN, um, and we use the total cross section to put bounds on the gamma zero parameter, uh, which is the dimensionless parameter for the minimum length. And we found that gamma zero needs to be smaller than 10 to the power 32. Uh, on a first glance, this is a terrible bound, it's not impressive at all. Uh, however, this is uh, 18 orders of magnitude improvement over. Um, 
a purely quadratic uh, uh, theories which use purely quadratic uh, non-relativistic GUP. So although it's not a great bound, we are slowly uh, chipping away. And, and actually, uh, as you can see in the, the next talk, uh, we, we've uh, able to use inflation to put even greater bounds on, uh, on the GUP parameters. So to summarize, we have formulated relativistic generalized search principle, principle leading to frame independent minimum length, uh, which leads to an effective field theory with minimum length, which works up to the Planck scale. Uh, we've calculated quantum gravity corrections to the cross section for electron muon scattering, and we've compared it to existing experiments in, uh, in CERN to put bounds on the parameters. And uh, what's, uh, what's in this for the future? Of course, since our prong Craig algebra describes the same irreducible representation, we have a spin two representation in there too, that obeys the same equations of motion, which can be exploited to get um, to a gravitational action that accommodates a uh, relativistic generalized assertive principle. And uh, I guess uh, you would hear about this uh, in the next talk. Thank you for your attention and thank you for the opportunity to speak here. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, are you in uh, Canada now? Yes. Oh, okay. So what time is it? It's three in the night or something? Yeah, it's uh, 2.15. Okay, good. Good. All right. All right. So thank you very much for your talk. And uh, are there any questions? Please raise your hand if you have one. Well, since there are no questions, uh, and we still have 15 minutes. May I ask my uh, may I ask question myself? Absolutely. Actually, I'm wondering uh, if I understand correctly. Your starting point is that you uh, well you, you treat it as a kind of a mathematical trick. So you start with the standard phase space of mechanics. You know the standard uh, x and p commutator, and then you make a nonlinear transformation. And then at the end of that, and then you say, declare really that uh, the momenta and positions that you obtained as a result of this nonlinear transformation are the physical ones, right? That's, that's basically the idea. That's how you get your uh, uh, modified uncertainty principle. Now, my question is, what makes you, what makes it possible for you to declare that? Because naively speaking, uh, having making kind of a nonlinear transformation of variable, you make the, your theory looking ugly, well, ugly, quote unquote, or, diff or more complicated at least. Uh, but it shouldn't be really any phys anything physical about it. So why you, uh, how, how can you argue that this particular nonlinear, because there are of course, uh, infinitely many nonlinear transformation of this kind. So the question is, how you could argue that this particular nonlinear transformation leads you to variables which are really physical and what does it mean that they are physical? Um, this is not exactly like a, a, an arbitrarily uh, uh, linear transformation. We also have a, a condition that we, I, I didn't mention is that when the minimum length uh, goes to zero, so there is no minimum length, we need to recover all the physics that we have so far. So Sure, but uh, it still leaves you with infinitely many transformations of this kind. Yes, of course, that's a consistency condition. Yes, that's of course, of course, I assume. Um, uh, you're correct. There is an infinitely, infinitely many and uh, we chose the, the one that gives us uh, the, the form uh, of the, the commutator that we, uh, we kind of needed. Okay, good. So, so, so the statement is that you have your commutator that you like and you need it for some reasons. This is, this is your uh, preferred or, uh, well, preferred for, for, of, 
modified um, of modified uh, uh, uncertainty relation, and then this this transition from the standard um, uh, uncertainty relation to yours is actually treated just by as a, as a mathematical trick, right? Correct. Okay. Good. Thank you. And that uh, makes it that makes it like uh, it, even uh, more interesting because you can uh, each different uh, nonlinear uh, deformation will give you a different theory, and uh, basically the only way you can distinguish uh, between which is right and which is wrong is through some uh, some kind of experimental evidence. Good. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for your talk. And now we switch, we turn to another speaker, to the next speaker. And I understand uh, the next speaker is uh, Dr. Nermeli. And I understand that your talks are kind of related to, your talk is kind of related to the previous one, right? Yes, that's correct. Okay, good. Uh, we have one minute to go, but I think you uh, just share your screen, please, and, and you can start right away. Right, is my screen visible? Yes. All right, so um, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Vijay. I've just completed my undergraduate studies from the Indian Institute of Technology, Bombay. And the title of my talk today will be Stell Gravity as the Limit of Quantum Gravity with Maximum Momentum. So this work, as you've already heard, is related to the previous talk. Um, it was done by Professor Shankar Narayanan, uh, Vasil Todorina, who you've just heard, Shorya Das, and myself. So let me begin with an overview. Um, you've heard the GUPs are used for modeling quantum gravity features. You saw how they can be used to manage, uh, to model minimal length or maximum momentum or uh, non-commutative space-time. And you saw in Vasil's talk how relativistic GUP corrections can be made to spin zero, spin half, and spin one fields. And when you put those all together, you get corrections to quantum electrodynamics. And a natural question, since we now know how GUPs affect spin zero, spin half, and spin one fields, is what about spin two fields? And that is really going to be what my talk is about. I'm going to show you how we can compute GUP corrections, our GUP corrections, to general relativity. And it's aesthetically pleasing because now we have a lexicon of how GUPs correct quantum fields of all kinds. But more than that, it's practical because the GPs are after all a phenomenological model. So we want them to make predictions, or at least we want to bound our parameters as of now. And I'll show you that we can use um, our GP modified GR to calculate corrections to early universe cosmology. And in the future, potentially, maybe even to black holes, although, although to my knowledge, it has not been done yet. So let's drop into the details. Um, I would ask you to recall the procedure mentioned in the last talk. I'm not going to stress too much on it because Vasil did a very thorough job. I just want to stress upon this point because it's the heart of the entire procedure. Um, as discussed previously, we replaced the canonical four momentum by the physical four momentum operator. And as you'll see, our procedures are going to be slightly different, but this step, the second step, is going to stay the key step of our entire procedure. So um, if we wanted to extend this analysis to general relativity, much like we did for um, spin zero or spin half fields, we would require the free field equations of gravity. And those um, are not the Einstein field equations because as we know when we're dealing with quantum field theory, the field that we're really looking for is not the full-fledged metric, it's the perturbation about the Minkowski background. So the equations that we're looking for are actually the linearized Einstein equations. And we could obtain that, uh, we could obtain those equations by truncating the Einstein-Hilbert action to the second order and then varying the action. But that is not what we will do to get the free field equations. We will proceed by a method which I believe is simpler and we will be more pedantic about it. And I believe it will make the corrections, the GP corrections that we are um, computing to this theory seem a lot more natural. But before I get into that, I should really mention what the procedure is. So we could go as before, we could compute the weak field equations for gravity, apply the GUP corrections, and then find out what scattering cross sections, um, what modifications we have to scattering cross sections. But that would be correcting weak gravity, and that is not really the aim of this project. What we really want to do is compute um, the corrections to general relativity in all its glory. So we'll be following a different procedure. The first step is the same. We start with the spin two equations. We replace the canonical four momentum by the physical four momentum. We get the modified spin two equations. And then we claim that these spin two equations can be obtained by linearizing the uh, equations of motion 
that stem from some modified einstein hilbert action i'm not yet going into what that modified einstein hilbert action is although the title should be a giveaway i just claim that there is some modified einstein hilbert action whose equations in the linear limit uh, match the equations that we obtained from steps one uh, from step one here and then by correspondence we claim that that effective einstein hilbert action really represents the um, classical limit of quantum field theory with uh, a maxwell momentum scale so how exactly would we carry out this procedure the first step of course is to obtain the spin two equations and i'll do that by a method that was put up by feynman in around 1970s although it was published much later so i've listed out all the steps here uh, i'm sorry i'm not going too much into depth i think it's pretty self explanatory the only thing i want to stress on is this redundant bilinear term and by that i mean um, we want to compute the lagrangian for this spin two field but in our formalism the fundamental construct is not really the lagrangian rather it's the action so if you were to have two bilinears that differ only by a four derivative then you could essentially throw out one of one of the bilinears and that's what i mean by redundant bilinears here so um, i'll just let you stare at these steps for a minute and then i'll show you how it actually applies to the spin two field okay so it turns out that um, the most general lagrangian you can have which is bilinear and accounting for four derivatives is what i've listed over here and as you can see there are undetermined coefficients there are four undetermined coefficients a b c and d so to fix these coefficients up to an overall factor we vary the equations of we vary the action we get the equations of motion we then appeal to energy momentum conservation and we end up with this equation and since the right hand side is zero the left hand side must be zero which fixes our coefficients as you can see up to a factor and an overall scale factor is not really um, a big problem for the action formalism so with that in mind we get the um, equations or we get the action uh, the lagrangian or the action which ever you prefer for the spin two field um, like so and i want to point out that we'll be dealing only with the free field action here it's true that i started off with an interaction interacting action but this interaction term which is lambda times h mu nu times t mu nu is not really relevant for our purposes we will not need any matter energy we will not need any matter source here so once we've computed the interacting lagrangian i'll just set t mu nu to zero um use it as a use and throw object so to speak and we'll end up with the free field lagrangian so now that we have the free field lagrangian for the spin two field the equations of motion naturally follow and now it's time to actually compute gp corrections in the linear limit so we'll be using um, a gup which models maxwell momentum and as you can see it's quite similar to the gup that vasil spoke about earlier um corresponding to this gup this is the physical four momentum operator we have in terms of the canonical four momentum operator which is just the gradient gradient of course and substituting this um into the einstein equations the linear as einstein equations gives us the gup modified equations for the spin two field so um there's a curly g factor here which brings out the gup corrections as you can see is proportional to the gp parameter gamma and i've listed the form of the um curly g minute tensor here so that completes our first step and um now as i said we claim that these equations can be obtained by linearizing the action or the equations of motion corresponding to some modified einstein hilbert action so what is a einstein hilbert action that's the next question the answer is self gravity or quadratic gravity it's not um i'll give a brief overview there's just one point which i really wish to emphasize um so this is the action for self gravity you can see that there are two parameters here alpha and beta and you can show that these parameters have to be constrained via this inequality so this stems from um the static localized isotropic solutions you can show that in the linear limit in addition to the um newtonian one over r potential we have yukawa potentials with masses given by so and so and if you want to avoid tachyonic instabilities that requires that the yukawa masses um be positive and that's how we get this inequality so that's all i would really want to say about star gravity it's uh, a beautiful theory in its own right but of course i don't have the time to talk about that so i'll just get to the equations of motion and discuss the correspondence with gp modified um general relativity so these are the equations of motion for star gravity you linearize them about the minkowski matrix that's what we get and you know that if we set alpha is equal to 2 beta in particular we on um, these equations over here reduce to the ones below and comparing them with the gup modified spin two equations that we got earlier which are listed below you can see that the equations are clearly equal if we set um our if we relate our gamma and our alpha parameters appropriately so you could just add these equations for a moment it's clear that all terms match and in particular um if we set alpha is equal to 2 beta is equal to gamma by kappa squared 
That means that we get a correspondence between alpha is equal to two beta star gravity and the GP modified spin two equations. And from that inequality that I spoke about earlier, relating the alpha and beta parameters, that also fixes the sign of our gamma parameter. So we now know that gamma must be more than zero in order to predict a maximum momentum and to correspond to star gravity in the way we've just discussed. There's one more interesting point I'd like to draw to your attention, which is um, I spoke about those Yukawa masses earlier, and from a quantum field theoretical viewpoint, those just correspond to a pair of extra massive gauge bosons. And while I didn't mention it previously, one of those um, massive gauge bosons is a scalar, and the other one is a tensor. And these are their masses. And as it turns out, when alpha is equal to two beta, these two masses, as you can clearly see, are in fact going to be equal. So in that sense, our theory is a little bit degenerate. And it's not clear what the meaning of this degeneracy is, but it's definitely worth probing in the future. So now that I've discussed the theoretical aspect of this model, I'm going to go to implications. I'm going to speak about how it affects inflation in particular. So it's well known that quantum corrections to gravity can lead to inflation. They can lead to alternate inflationary models as opposed to the standard um, inflator model. And since we know that star gravity models GUP modified um, GR, the next question we should ask is, OK, using GUP modified GR, can we obtain inflation with an exit? And the short answer is yes. And I will show that to you analytically and via some numerical um, solving. So first, we substitute the FRW metric, which is, of course, our starting point, into the Stell equations with unconstrained parameters. Since I'm working with GUP modified GR, you would expect that I would have to substitute into the equations with alpha is equal to 2 beta. But I'm not going to do that, and you'll see in a minute why. Let's substitute the FRW metric into the Stell EOM with alpha and beta so far unconstrained, except, of course, for that inequality. So these are the equations of motion we obtain in terms of the Hubble parameter. And what you can clearly see is that all the dependence of the parameters alpha and beta is um, coming from this lambda factor. And in particular, the qualitative dynamics obtained from these equations of motion is the same regardless of what the relative ratios of alpha and beta are. And how does that help us? Um, it means that if we know how style gravity be behaves for even one particular um, ratio between alpha and beta, we know how it behaves with any generic style theory model. And as it turns out, we already know that. We know that if we were to set alpha is equal to 0, the equations that we get here, this equation and this equation, are identical to the Starobinsky model equations that we um, obtained from, from the Starobinsky action. So this is the Stratovinsky action that I've listed here in its standard form. That would be corresponding to alpha equal to 0 and beta equal to 1 over 12 kappa m squared. And kappa is, um, or rather kappa squared, is 8 pi times g here. And we know that Stratovinsky gravity leads to inflation. And we know that alpha is equal to 0 means that these equations relate, re resolve to the Stratovinsky equation, which means that GP modified gravity also predicts inflation with exit. GP modified gravity and, in fact, any um, style theory corresponds to inflation with an exit. So that's the analytical proof of how we would obtain inflation from style gravity. The next question is, of course, being a phenomenological model, we should try to bound our parameters. And can we do that using our inflation theory here and some data from CMB? So that's the last part of my talk. I'll talk about how to bound the RGP parameter. Um, and we start by numerically solving those equations that I mentioned earlier, the two equations in terms of the Hubble parameter. So I should point out that those two equations are not really um, independent. They're related by the Bianchi identities. So there's really only one equation to solve. And we'll solve the first equation because it's second order in the Hubble parameter, as opposed to the second one, which is third order. Now, these equations are really bad for solving because the Hubble parameter during inflation takes pretty large values, while the gamma parameter being a GUP parameter takes really small values. So there's that imbalance between large numbers and small numbers, which makes um, numerical solving really difficult. So we need to transform the equation into a form that's more amenable to our techniques. And for that reason, we define S is equal to T by square root of gamma. So T is cosmic time. Um, gamma is, of course, the GP parameter, which I should point out has dimensions of length squared, making this S, which I should refer to as the rescaled cosmic time, dimensionless. We change our dynamical variable into BRS, defined like so. And I should point out that H inf is basically the inflationary energy scale. It's a constant representing the scale of the inflation. And um, then we have our final variable here. So our final equation of motion can be written in this form. And when we solve for A of S using the B of S that we get from this equation, and we plot it, we get this. We get this graph. And you can clearly see the convex to concave transition that shows that we really do have inflation. And if that's not enough, we can also plot the slow roll parameter. And as we all know, the slow roll parameter must be 0 or between 0 and 1 during inflation. 
and greater than one after inflation. And that is exactly what we see here. So graphically as well, we've, dis we've discovered that our equations really do lead to inflation. Now, how do we bound the parameter? Well, there's really only one thing that we can do if we want to analyze these graphs, and that's to look at the exit time, the time when the slower parameter is one, which is to say the time when the inflation stops. And we did that. We plotted the um, rescaled exit time as a function of u. And what you'll find is that interestingly, they approximately share the same order of magnitude. We've actually plotted a log plot other than an S0 versus U plot directly, but the relation should be clear. So S0 is similar to U holds as an order to magnitude relation. So in order to determine our GUP parameters, we make a couple of other definitions. Um, gamma naught was already introduced in the previous talk. It's gamma divided by the square of the Planck length. And it represents the ratio of the GUP length scale, whatever that may be, to the Planck length scale. So in terms of these parameters, we can write S0, which is our rescaled um, exit time, as alpha by gamma naught. And because we have alpha naught, or because we have S naught similar to U, we can simply substitute S naught with U in this equation. And a little bit of simplification after that gives us this equation. So we've obtained gamma naught in terms of alpha, which um, if you'll recall is the is basically the scale, time scale of inflation. H inf is the parameter describing inflationary energy scales, and Planck length is, well, the Planck length. So because we have good bounds in all these three parameters, we can bound gamma naught very accurately. So first of all, I should point out that we need um, our gamma naught parameter to be such that the GUP energy scale exceeds the certain scale for obvious reasons. And that itself fixes gamma naught lesser than 10 to the 15, which is pretty good. Um, and from these remaining bounds that we spoke of earlier, H inf um, we take to be 10 power minus five. It's supposed to be bounded by 10 power minus four but we take 10 power minus five, which coincides with the GUT scale. Alpha and typical models takes this range, but you'll have noticed our method is really hand wavy. It's really non-rigorous. So there's a very good chance of error. And to account for those errors, we just stretch our bounds on both sides. So we use these bounds of alpha on, on alpha. So substituting these bounds and accounting for what we already have from here, we get our final constraint as 10 to the 10 is lesser than gamma naught is lesser than 10 to the 15. And this is much stronger than what we got from the from um, quantum electrodynamics, which should be clear because we're working with a strong gravity regime. So naturally our corrections would be better. And in terms of the gamma parameter itself, we have the following bounds. I should also like to draw your attention to one more interesting point, which is that so far, um, at least to my knowledge, there are no double-sided bounds in inflationary parameters, or GB parameters, I'm sorry. We obtained a lower bound before, and most of the bonds obtained are lower bonds, but a double-sided bound is actually pretty rare. So that's a good feature of our um, of our model, and that concludes my talk. I would I'll summarize by talking about the three key results we spoke about. We spoke about how GUPs with maximal momentum can be related to stellar gravity with alpha equal to two beta, and I've listed the modified action for you here. We spoke about how it can lead to inflation, both GUP modified gravity and generic stellar gravity, and then we bounded our gamma parameter using inflationary considerations. And I should stress that our bounds are stringent and double sided. So what are the future prospects? Um, we spoke about how maximal momentum can be modeled in a classical limit, but um, it's also possible that we could model other effects like minimal length or non-commutative space-time in similar mannerisms. So that's something we would definitely like to try out. And second, since we know that alpha is equal to two beta style gravity models maximal momentum, we can study the effects of momentum cut off at the classical limit by simply substituting the cell um, framework into whatever system we have. So those are the phenomenological aspects we can look forward to. Theoretically, there are two interesting questions which I'd like to conclude with. So the first one I already drew your attention to. We have a degeneracy in the gauge boson masses, and it's not at all clear what that is. What are the effects of that, both theoretical and phenomenological? And we'd like to explore that in the future. And second, um, you saw how we related the GUP to just one class of cell theories. And a natural question to ask would be, okay, could we extend our GUP theory to a two-parameter GUP theory, possibly one that's one of them that um, Vassal mentioned earlier. And could this GUP possibly have the um, have a correspondence with generic cell gravity in much the same way that our current GUP has with alpha is equal to two beta cell gravity? So that's what we have to look forward to. And this concludes my talk. Um, thank you for your time. And if you have any questions, I'd be glad to take them. Thank you for your talk and uh, please raise your hand. Jan Novak, please. Hi. Uh, there, are there some uh, 
um, constraints from Lego Virgo collaboration to stellar gravities or uh, how it is uh, with uh, constraints, I mean, to this type of gravities, modified gravities, I mean? There are a few constraints on these style parameters from, um, from LIGO observations, but so far they are not in contradiction with anything we have obtained so far. In fact, being only from weak gravity, they are actually, uh, being only from gravitational waves, they are actually pretty loose, which allows practically any constraint we speak about to, uh, to stay within the bounds predicted by the LIGO collaboration. Thank you. Okay, any further questions? All right, if he, there are no further questions, since we still have some time, perhaps I ask a couple of questions. The first thing is that uh, it's kind of a common wisdom that stellar gravity is, is physically thick. So when you quantize, do you have some, you have ghosts and, and it's quantum mechanically, it's kind of quantum mechanically <clears throat> uh, not, uh, consistent uh, for your for your set of parameters. Does it your set does your set of parameters uh, help this in some way? Yes, um, it turns out that for a particular class of star gravity theories, which I have mentioned, yeah, um, the modified theory does not possess malicious ghosts, and that I believe happens if you have your alpha pair parameter being greater than or equal to zero. This was shown in this work. I'm not 100 percent sure of the details. But I mean, I know that for alpha greater than or equal to zero, there are no problems associated with ghosts that come for this theory. Okay, good, thank you. And the second question is because you're claiming that the stellar gravity is the gravity of <clears throat> uh, which realizes the maximum momentum and stuff. But do I, did I understand correctly that you, that you actually, that this claim comes just from, from the comparison of linearized theory of, of so linear stellar gravity with the theory with linear theory that you kind of uh, gotten uh, from this modified uncertainty principle. Yes, we claim a correspondence depending uh, because of the matching. Oh, so you claim the correspondence based on the on the linearized theory, right? On, on the yes. form of the linear theory. Okay. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Uh, well, if there are no, oh, there is one question, sorry. Uh, yeah. yes, go ahead, uh, in equation 12, can you say something about how many degrees of polarization would be there? Uh, and fundamental uh, number of modes, like in zero, it's two modes of polarization. From our equation 12, uh, how many number of modes of polarization would be there? Um, we definitely expect additional polarization modes. Um, we haven't really conducted a thorough study, so I cannot be sure as of current exactly how many modes you would, you would be able to get. But suffice to say, there will be definitely extra polarization modes. OK. OK, I mean, to, to follow up, I, I mean, uh, there is some uh, in in this theory in this linear theory there is some number of modes but among them you have this uh, spin two mode uh, yes. with the, the standard properties right so massless spinless uh, mass massless spin field a uh, spin two field right yes okay and, in and what is the spectrum what is the total spectrum of the theory so apart from this a massless spin two, do you have some, uh, because you mentioned at some point that you have some other excitations in this theory, right? Yes, we have a massive scalar boson and a massive tensor boson. Okay, good, thank you. Some more questions? Well, if not, then thank, thank you again for your nice talk. Thank and you. Uh, well, we finished this block, which, oh, uh, Mr. Todorino also raised his hand. Uh, you still we still have a couple of minutes, so please ask questions. Oh, yes. Just, uh, this, this is the applause emoji. Thank you, Russell. I don't have any questions. I actually collaborated. Oh, I see. Okay, good. So let's uh, let's applaud and uh, and thank you again. And now we turn to to the next speaker. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker is.
friends. Uh, meet your Friedman again. Hello. Hello again. Hello again. And uh, yes, so you know the drill. Just please go ahead. Uh, just do it slowly because we still have a couple of minutes before the before the start. Okay. Okay, sure. Yeah, I, I can go slowly. Not. Oh, you you're the same university in Alberta? Uh, yes. Yeah, I in Alberta with... too. You so it's two thirty or something. Uh, no, I'm now in Slovenia, back with uh, my family. Oh, I see. Okay. Came to visit and also shared the office with Vasil. So that is also my office. Oh. That in, so okay. in Vasil. Uh, Good, uh, good, good, good. Because you know, the, giving a talk at two thirty is really insane. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. I have the same time uh, as you. Good. Okay. Right. Okay. So go ahead. Please start. Okay. So uh, thank you for the opportunity for not just one talk but two talks uh, on this uh, very nice uh, meeting, Marcel Grossman meeting. So for my second talk, I'll be presenting. Uh, the test of quantum gravity in statistical mechanics, which I have uh, done this work with my supervisor, Dr. Soria Das. Uh, here is a brief overview of my talk. First, I will give some motivations and uh, goals of uh, the work. Then I'll present the standard equations, the standard observables for the Bose-Einstein condensation. So then uh, we can compare later to the modified ones, which we will get when we will first consider the presence of extra compact dimensions. And then separately, when we consider the GOP, which is due to minimal length. And of course, at the end, I will uh, summarize with the concluding remarks. Okay, to, so to start, uh, many great thinkers since ancient times up to today have asked themselves the question, what is the fundamental reality of nature? One of such thinkers was Democritus, seen in this picture, who proposed that matter is made out of small indivisible parts called atoms. Today, we know that atoms are not indivisible, but nevertheless, this insight was uh, pretty good for his time. Uh, why not say the same thing about space-time? Is space-time also made out of small fundamental parts or is it continuous as we uh, experience it every day? Uh, so far, we have two successful, very successful theories of nature. On one hand, we have quantum mechanics and quantum field theory, which describe interactions on the smallest scales. And on the other hand, we have general relativity, which describes gravitational interactions on the largest scales. We expect scenarios where, though, where we have contributions from both the regimes, the energy, the energies where we expect that quantum theory and general relativity overlap. But there is no nice way, no beautiful way to put them together, these two theories. But uh, people have tried with many different approaches, with many uh, new approaches to theories, uh, which none of have been tested yet uh, in a laboratory. However, most of the theories and most of the approaches agree that the air is a minimal measurable length, that there should be some discreteness uh, fundamental discreteness to space-time. So to describe this fundamental discreteness, we use the generalized uncertainty principle. Uh, yesterday when I had my talk, this slide was pretty similar, but this one is the only one that has uh, the similarity because I used the GUP also on my yesterday talk. So this is the, the modification of the Heisenberg uncertainty, which is uh, given in this uh, commutator form. And the Heisenberg uncertainty is just a uh, black script. And then the generalization is made by these two additional terms, red terms, which are called the GOP or quantum gravity terms, which describe minimal length. And also the linear part also then implies a maximum momentum. And this alpha and beta parameters are called, then called the GOP parameters, which are expressed as follows, where we see alpha naught and beta naught are just dimensionless parameters. LP is the Planck uh, length and H bar is the Planck scale. So this model can describe any length scale between alpha naught LP and the square root of beta naught LP between the electroweak and the Planck scales. Since we have, uh, I mean, the experimentalists at CERN have already probed the scales of up to the electroweak scale. I didn't find any effects of quantum gravity. So this model can then describe any 
new length scale, the quantum gravity scale between those two scales, between the Planck and the electroweak. Also, I'll mention here that the uh, quantum gravity effects are believed to be universal, which means that not only at Planck scales, at Planck energies, that we expect to see quantum gravity effects, but this means that we can also uh, observe quantum gravity effects at low energies, but their magnitudes are very, very small. So need, we need very, very precise experiments to detect such small uh, deviations uh, or sorts, such small effects. Uh, so how do we use it? The GOP, we apply the general alternative principle to quantum mechanical and gravitational systems. And then we search or predict deviations from standard theory. And in this case, uh, for this talk specifically, I will be considering the Bose-Einstein condensate, which is based on the work uh, test of quantum gravity and statistical mechanics by my supervisor, Soredas, and me, which has also been uh, uh, accepted this weekend for publication in uh, PRD. So what is a Bose-Einstein condensate? A Bose-Einstein condensate is an exotic state of matter uh, which occurs when we have a gas of bosons which are spin zero particles and we cool them down to very, very extremely low temperatures near uh, zero Kelvin. And they go through this phase transition when the particles, bosons start to accumulate in the ground state. And we can see in this picture, this picture was uh, actually the Nobel Prize winning picture from the University of Colorado in Boulder, which uh, they got a Nobel Prize for this. And here the X and Y axis are the velocity uh, distributions in X and Y directions. And the Z axis is of course the number of bosons. And here we see that this phase transition, the first picture is just before the phase transition where we have this usual uh, distribution. And then when we lower the temperature below the critical temperature, we get this phase transition where the, we, have, we get this non-trivial peak, which represents the particles getting in this condensate state. And when we lower the temperature, you can see on this third picture, more, more and more particles get into this condensate state. So as I mentioned before, I'll first uh, provide some equations uh, of the observables for, from the standard theory. So we can then compare uh, the results from the when I'll consider the effects of compact extra dimensions and then separately the effects of the GOP corrections. So here are now the standard equations from the standard theory. As we can see, we can divide uh, the Bose Einstein condensate in a non relativistic and in a relativistic uh, case. And also we can see that a relativistic case is uh, sensitive to the charge of the uh, bosons. If they are neutral, it has a different uh, results, different expressions for the critical temperature and the fraction of bosons in the ground state, which are our two observables. And then for the charge case also. But for the non-relativistic case, uh, the statistics are not affected by the charge. And we can also see here that this theory here, standard theory is computed for arbitrary d spatial dimensions. Uh, and n is the number density of particles, m is the mass of the bosons. And we see that there are different powers to these n's for, for each different case. And we have also a different powers for this fraction of bosons in the ground state, depending on the case. And also one interesting thing is that the uh, non-relativistic case and the relativistic charge case are dependent on the mass of the bosons while the neutral relativistic case is not dependent on uh, the mass of the constituent particles. So now let's uh, discuss Bose-Einstein condensation in compact, dimen compact extra dimensions. We consider a space topology, which is Rd times Sn, which means we have the non uh, Euclidean non-compact dimensions uh, alongside an n-dimensional spherical uh, dimensional space. So for such a space topology, Shiraishi in his paper from 1987 has proposed that the number density for in such a topology can be expressed with this following equation, where we have an infinite sum of such integrals. And these DL are just the degeneracy factors. Uh, which is also usually for non with non compact dimensions we don't have this sum but still this integral is uh, usually used to compute any Bose Einstein condensate in this way. So here we have two terms. This is one equation, but I didn't have enough space to put it in one line. So 
these are two terms in this bracket. So this first term is for particles, which have minus mu. This denotes that we are considering particles. And then for antiparticles, which has a plus mu. And then we also notice here that we have an extra term in this uh, energy, the relativistic energy term, which corresponds to the energy, uh, this, uh, the energy that is lost in those extra dimensions. So here are just this, uh, how this degeneracy factor is expressed in terms of the dimensionality of the compact uh, space. And this omega L, as I mentioned, are the contributions to energy that uh, are lost in the compact uh, dimensions. And this is then dependent on the radius of the compact dimension R. So then we, uh, by, by some constraints, we then compute for the non-relativistic case, the critical temperature and the fraction of bosons in the ground state. And we see that it, in the leading order is the usual theory that we saw on the standard theory slide. We get this standard uh, term plus this or minus this extra term, which is due to the presence of compact extra dimensions. And the parameter here is then just the radius of this compact extra dimensions. And uh, we can see also that the fractional bosons get, gets modified in a similar way with this exponential factor containing this uh, radius and in the denominator, we also have this radius of the compact extra dimensions. So what the next thing, what we want to like, we want to visualize this uh, critical temperature. Now uh, we then just divide this extra term by the leading term to get the relative, uh, to get the relative temperature. And we plotted this relative temperature as a function of this radius of the compact dimension. And because of that exponential factor and because of that radius in the, denominator, we get this non-trivial dependence of the correction of for this parameter r. And since this correction is so, so small, because current experimental uh, threshold for the Bose-Einstein condensate is about uh, relative, for the relative temperature is about 10 to the minus 10 or 10 to the minus 11. So this is like 15 or 16 orders of magnitude yet from our uh, detection. So then we assume in future, we hope that experiments will get uh, good enough that we will uh, measure it one day that it will come, let's say up to this point, our precision, uh, the measurement. And if we don't uh, observe any compact extra dimension effect, as we expect, we get two bounds. We get an upper bound and a lower bound simultaneously, which is the first time we, uh, that to our knowledge that we observe such constraints to the dimensions of, uh, to the radius of the compact dimensions. So the next thing then is to discuss the bose andes condensation with the GUP corrections. First, what we do if we consider the GUP, uh, we have the physical uh, momentum and physical uh, uh, space op operators. Now we, this is one of the choices, as you were discussing before with Vasil, we have many choices to do this uh, uh, transformation to express it in terms of the canonical operators, which we know how to handle very well, which we know that they follow this canonical commutation relation. And then we use this uh, definition of the physical operator given the canonical operator and we use it in the dispersion relation the usual non relativistic in this case uh, dispersion relation and then we see we get this leading term and two quantum gravity extra terms and then we use this to compute the quantum gravity corrected energy spectrum in three dimensions uh, using the first order perturbation theory in quantum mechanics where this kn is the uh, discrete discretized the quantized wave vector however our uh, colleague pasquale boso has uh, computed this energy spectrum exactly but in one dimension but we are, have to consider three dimensions for our case so we have to use the perturbation theory so let's hope he will also uh, get an exact solution soon for the three-dimensional case so we used then this uh, modified energy spectrum to modify the fundamental cell and then we derived from that the modified quantum gravity corrected density of states. Where you see this first part is just the standard theory and then it has plus linear and quadratic GUP corrections. And this have been then used to compute the, the R observables, the critical temperature and the fraction of bosons in the ground state. And here we see this is the usual theory and we had to evaluate it at D3 at the D spatial dimensions because there is no trivial way to generalize the density of states in this derivation to D dimensions. And we have here a linear and quadratic corrections to this usual theory. 
as well as for the fraction of bosons in the ground state with their linear and quadratic uh, corrections. So again, as in the previous case, we want to compute the relative uh, temperature. We just divide these two terms by the leading term and plot. This. So we plot this relative temperature as a uh, logarithm as a function of the number density of particles for four different quantum gravity parameters where this black line represents the experimental accuracy of, of the current experiments. So uh, if we detect uh, the quantum gravity effects in a Bose-Einstein condensate by measuring the temperature, we can say that the uh, quantum gravity parameter is uh, alpha naught being 10 to the power of 19, if that would be the case. Then the next, I have plotted uh, the fraction of bosons in the ground state, the correction, uh, the absolute correction in this case, uh, because it's dimensionless, so it doesn't uh, pro provide any problems. So we also plotted this uh, correction for four different quantum gravity parameters. And here is the, the black line represents the experimental accuracy of measuring the fractions. But here we see that to observe it, the uh, quantum gravity scale had to, has to have this parameter being large 10 to the power 25. So for uh, phenomenologically more significant observable is then the critical temp temperature rather than uh, the fraction of bosons in the ground state. So now let's consider the relativistic case. We use the uh, fischbach villars formalism, where we use this effective Hamiltonian, where tau 3 and tau 2 are the Pauli matrices. And then we use that uh, physical momentum expressed in terms of the canonical uh, operators to get these two extra terms due to quantum uh, gravity effects. Uh, we do the same procedure. We compute the quantum gravity corrected energy spectrum using the first order perturbation theory. And then we modify the, pardon me, we modify the density of states in this way, where this is the usual density of states for the relativistic parts, particles. And uh, these are alpha and beta linear and quadratic uh, GOP corrections to this uh, density of states. And then again, uh, the, we, computed observables, the critical temperature and the fraction of bosons in the ground state first for the neutral case, where we see there this is the standard theory plus linear quadratic terms. And the fraction also has this standard theory plus linear and quadratic terms. And again, I'll note here that we have had to evaluate this in three dimensions because there's no trivial way to generalize the density of uh, states for D dimension in that uh, specific derivation. And also for the charged case, the standard theory, linear quadratic corrections, and this standard theory plus linear and quadratic corrections. And as the same, uh, in the same way as for the uh, non-relativistic case, I have plotted uh, now both for neutral and uh, uh, charged cases, I've plotted the solid lines are, uh, represent the neutral, the, yeah, the neutral Bose-Einstein condensation and the dashed, dashed lines represent the charged case. Uh, but however, we see here that if we take the first two lines to compare the uh, charged and neutral, we see that alpha naught for the top line is 10 to the power of 19, while for the charged case is 10 to the power of 24. So we had to have like five, five orders of magnitude bigger precision to detect the charged uh, case than for the neutral case. However, one thing that you can note, notice here, there is no black line here. So there is no experimental uh, accuracy for this case. The reason for this is because there is currently no experimental realization for a relativistic Bose-Einstein condensate yet. So this means these results are still uh, relevant when uh, technology will develop so far that uh, experimentalists will be able to produce a relativistic Bose-Einstein condensate. These results could then be used to probe for quantum gravity effects. The same goes for the fraction of bosons in the ground state. These are the corrections. Also plotted four for the neutral case and four for the charge case, where again, the solid lines represent uh, the neutral case and the dashed lines represent the charged case. And you can see that I, I forgot to mention before in the non-relativistic case, there is a peak. It's a, it's a peak. So there is some temperature at which those effects in the fraction of bosons are also maximum. And also for the same reason, there is no experimental black line here because there is no experimental realization as so far. So now to summarize the, the talk, uh, this work 
can test the fundamental physics of nature, it can probe quantum gravity uh, if the, such effects are detected. Uh, and now to discuss something about the compact extra dimensions, uh, the results for, with the addition of compact extra dimensions suggest there is an upper and lower bound to the radii of the compact uh, dimensions, which is, as we've seen, uh, as, to our knowledge, is the first time we've seen such uh, a constraint. And also for the GOP part, the modification of density of states actually provides a nice, a nice mechanism to use it in uh, all statistical mechanics. And in, in this way, it can provide everything that you, almost everything that you can compute in uh, statistical mechanics, you will in any way need this density of states. So it, in this case, it can provide a very rich phenomenology in, uh, in statistical mechanics. Now, uh, what are the final uh, findings for the BEC in, uh, with GOP corrections? If such effects are observed, if they can be observed, this means there has to exist uh, an intermediate Planck scale between the electric and the Planck scale. So it doesn't have to be the Planck scale, uh, the Planck length itself, the minimum length. It can be larger than that. But if no effects are observed, this work is still relevant. So we can constrain the GOP parameters values alpha not being less than 10 to the power of 19 and beta not being less than 10 uh, to the power of 46, which are not that good. They are, some predictions are even better than this to, to constrain the parameters. But uh, in future, we still hope that experimental uh, precision will improve and that this, these effects might be still detected in such systems. So this was everything from my side and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. Uh, we still have five minutes for, for questions, so please raise your hand. Jan Novak again. Uh, hi, please. Did, did you discuss your result concerning the number of uh, the extra dimensions or uh, do you have some constraint on the number of... Uh... Uh, that, uh, that graph that I showed, that was specifically for three spatial dimensions and one uh, extra dimension. So it's just a circle. That, is, uh, that spherical dimension is just a circle uh, for that case. But we could do more dimensions and we can get similar, but that peak would be a bit shifted. So that, that would then test, that would be the way to test uh, how many extra dimensions are there if there are extra dimensions. Yes, is the this is the end? Yeah. Does that answer okay. your question? Good. Uh, any more questions, please? Well, all right. If there are no questions, thank you again for a okay. nice talk. And now we still have uh, well, we still have four minutes, but I think we can uh, we can go ahead with Mr. Kalita. Uh, could you please, could you please try to share? Yes, great. Yeah, I'm audible. Uh, yes, uh, if you can raise volume of your microphone a little bit. Okay, uh, now is it better? Now it's better, thank you. Okay. Uh, look, uh, yeah, I guess, I guess we can start. Yes, please, please okay. go ahead and start. Sure. Uh, thanks. Uh, so today I will be talking about violation of Chandrasekhar mass limit in non-commutative geometry. So I'll come to the uh, meaning of these terms one by one when I'll proceed. And uh, this work has been done with my supervisor, Bani Brata, and uh, my collaborator, T.R. Govindarajan from Institute of Mathematical Sciences. And the preliminary result has already been published in this paper recently, and some further works has already been archived and is currently under review. Uh, so what is non-commutative geometry? Uh, so all, some speakers have given a hint earlier. So for example, in ordinary quantum mechanics, we know that uh, position, position operator and the momentum momentum operators commute among themselves whereas position and momentum operators do not commute among themselves. So this is the ordinary Heisenberg algebra, which we all know. However, in what happens in non-commutative geometry, these operators uh, among themselves even do not commute. 
For example, let's say if I consider a planar non-commutative geometry, say the non-commutativity is only in the xy plane, such that x comma y, like here it's zero, but it's non-zero, there are some non-commutative parameter like theta kind of stuff. And because uh, px and py it's conjugate momentum, so they are also non-commutative accordingly. So in this case, basically what's the idea is that this blue plane is uh, non-commutative, whereas other planes are commutative. This idea has, all, uh, has been guessed and has been already been applied with the idea of the magnetic field. For example, if I have a magnetic field, for example, in this direction, the vertical direction, we know that there are, uh, the plane is quantized, the perpendicular plane uh, corresponding to uh, perpendicular plane to the magnetic field direction is quantized and we obtain the Landau levels. So it's similar, this, it's, this idea is very much similar, just you can think it's like an internally generated uh, magnetic field or something like that, but uh, this is one idea. But this is only planar non commutative directions, the non commutative is in one plane. What about if we go for a three dimensional non commutivity? So the idea is uh, there is one uh, algebra called fuzzy sphere non commutative algebra, first introduced by Madurai in 1982, where uh, it's been assumed with the position operators, that means this x, y, and z, these three uh, op uh, position operators follow exactly the angular momentum algebra. We know the angular momentum algebra, these are SU2 algebra, so GIJJ is commuting to JK, any two will give the third component. In a fuzzy sphere algebra, what we do, uh, this GI has been replaced by XI, XI is the position operator, and this is exactly related with this GI, with some uh, proportionality constant. So accordingly, this is the fuzzy sphere algebra. Now, uh, later, uh, this Tenekar and his student has given one idea called squash fuzzy sphere algebra. What they have done, uh, they have projected each of the points of this sphere to an equatorial plane. For example, in this figure, I have shown the x1, x2, basically xy equatorial plane. In that case, this algebra has been modified to this kind of stuff. As you can see, the algebra is now this, if I put i equal to one, j equal to two, and k equal to three, and then x3 uh, can be written exactly like this from the equation of the sphere. So this algebra is called the squash fuzzy sphere algebra, and there are plus and minus sign depending whether I'm in the upper side of the plane or the lower side of the plane. Uh, now, with this algebra, I want to get some modified dispersion relation, basically a dispersion relation. Now, since this is an SU2 algebra, it always have an Casimir operator, and we all know that Casimir, any SU2 algebra can be written in n by n irreducible representation. In that case, uh, the square, uh, the sum of the squares of all three angular momenta gives uh, this, uh, this relation. And also we know the relation between X and J. Substituting here, we can easily obtain the relation between the K, uh, this is the non-commutative parameter, R is the radius of the fuzzy sphere, and N is the n-dimensional representation that matrix N. So uh, with this idea, we can finally write the Dirac operator in this fuzzy sphere. The Dirac operator, since I have shown the fuzzy sphere is been squashed in the <coughs> XY plane, that means X1, X2 plane, the Dirac operator comes like this. So sigma one, these are the poly matrices, sigma one and sigma two. So if we just square the Dirac operator, we obtain this, this expression. And from here, it's been quite trivial to obtain the energy eigenvalues from here. And you can see the energy eigenvalue looks like this, where sigma three has the eigenvalues plus one and minus one, two eigenvalues. So the other plus one and my plus minus sign appears here. Now the important point, as I have said, suppose the squash plane is not the x1, x2 plane, let's say x1, x3 plane, then it would be x1, x3 here, and the x2 will come here. But since we know that, uh, or so sigma two will come here, but we know that all the poly matrices have the same eigenvalues. So this energy eigenvalues, basically energy dispersion relation, will not be effective with the direction of the squashed plane. And how we can also understand this, as I have shown the algebra, non-commutative algebra in the squashed plane is x1, x2, which is like this, we can write this in the spherical polar coordinate. 
So X1 will be R sine theta cos phi and so on. And R is constant, basically it's the sphere uh, radius of this one sphere. So we can take out and it can be found, it can be understood that the squashing is not important in which direction because inherently it gives the non-commutativity between the theta and the phi, phi coordinates, basically two angular coordinates. And our radial coordinates is free. In that sense, we can write uh, this, this portion as I have shown is this one. Along with this, we introduce the race mass energy of particles. So for electrons, we'll be considering eventually. So I'm writing the mass of electron here and the momentum here. And if n is very, very greater than one, then this expression can easily be reduced to this kind of expression. Now from this expression, we can easily understand that it is exactly similar to the expression or not exactly, I mean, equivalent to the expression of the magnetic field, uh, lambda Lovins in the presence of magnetic field, where uh, this thing has been known for many years that energy dispersion relation, if the magnetic field is around Z direction, Z direction is free, it's like this, and the X, Y direction has been uh, kind of given by non-commutative or magnetic field. So this is the relation, and this is called the swinger magnetic field. And nu is the quantized uh, quantum number, basically it goes from zero, one, two, et cetera. And you can see this, this expression, and this expression is exactly the same, except here B, is a equivalent of one over K, basically K inverse. K is the, uh, if you remember, K is the proper, I mean, this non-commutative parameter. So one by K is given the strength of the non-commutativity in our uh, model. However, why not then magnetic field, which we all know can be observed and uh, can be measured easily? Because magnetic field has another effect called the classical effect. That means magnetic field gives pressure uh, called magnetic field pressure, and those can be expressed as Maxwell stress energy tensor, which you all learn in the uh, classical electrodynamics. And this magnetic stress energy tensor, if fine, uh, can be written, can be uh, decomposed in three terms. If the magnetic field is along the z direction, you will find that the, in the z direction, magnetic pressure is more, giving some additional pressure, and in the other two x and y direction, it will reduce the pressure. So accordingly, it will change the shape of any object. For example, if I take a spherical object, say I have a magnetic field around this direction, then the pressure is along this direction and it becomes like an oblate shape. If the magnetic field is like a torus-like field or toroidal magnetic field, then it will become an a prolate-like shape. So accordingly, these things has been difficult. I mean, these things are important in the case of magnetic field. However, in the non-commutative geometry, even though the uh, energy dispersion relation looks like the similar, there will not be no classical effect like this field pressure like stuff. And we do not require this kind of additional effect to consider in our calculation. Uh, so this is our uh, part of energy dispersion relation as I have shown, which contains uh, these uh, quantum numbers, M and L, basically N gives the maximum how many energy levels are filled and M goes from minus L to L. It's simple, uh, simple angular momentum algebra. So the final energy dispersion relation looks like this, where the rates are the up spin particles. I'm calling up basically because I'm considering this plus sign and the green are the this minus sign particle. And you can see the ground levels are, ground levels have one up spin and one down spin particles and all the other levels have two up and two down spin particles. So this is the kind of energy dispersion uh, relation and the energy spectra looks like, and this is given in this paper. So with this, uh, basically with this full energy, disp uh, full energy dispersion relation, now let's go back and to check how uh, equation of state in a white dwarf look like. So uh, another important thing here is that, as I have shown that uh, here, there are many fuzzy spheres has been considered, concentric spheres. And as I have shown that uh, inverse of K defend, uh, gives the strength of non-commutativity. And if you remember K goes, K is proportional to R. So inverse of K is goes inverse of R. So that means that the strength of non-commutativity is the maximum at the center. And it's uh, decreasing, decreasing at, at the surface, it's exactly identically zero. So, uh, so this much about the non-commutative stuff. Now let's go to the white dwarf thing, which I want to say, one application of that energy dispersion relation here. 
So what is a white dwarf? White dwarf is a, uh, instead of a star, if the star has a mass of say 10, little bit plus minus two solar mass, uh, at the end of its life, when the nuclear burning is over, after going some more phases, it will become a white dwarf. And in a white dwarf, uh, we all know that inward gravitational pull and the outward uh, dissonant electron gas pressure are balanced each other to attain a stable equilibrium condition. And uh, there are some other thing like, uh, uh, if a white dwarf is here, there is some other massive star, uh, it will start pulling matter from the star and eventually its mass will increase. And Chandrasekhar in 1930s shows that a white dwarf can have maximum of 1.4 solar mass, which is called, now we call the Chandrasekhar mass limit, above which this pressure balance will no longer sustain and it will produce to burn a type 1 a supernova. And type 1 a supernova, we all know, are very much useful in cosmology because they are used as standard candle to measure various luminosity distances. So this much enough, I guess, for uh, an introduction of the white dwarf. I'll now focus on this degenerate electron gas. What is this? A degenerate electron gas is called whenever the electron, because we all know that electrons are Fermi, follow Fermi direct distribution. And in a white dwarf, we always know that the temperature is much, much smaller than the Fermi temperature. Fermi temperature depends on the density. And since white dwarf density is high, Fermi temperature will be high. However, the normal temperature, uh, the measured temperature of the white dwarf is small. In that case, this Fermi distribution function reduces to this step function. And this kind of configurations are called the degenerate electron gas. So in that case, white dwarfs are assumed to be cold and zero temperature calculation is a good approximation. So with this Fermi, this Fermi direct distribution, and if we use ordinary commutative algebra, that means E square is equal to P square C square plus M square C power four, Chandrasekhar showed in 1930s that this, is, this should be the equation of state. Equation of state means relation between the pressure and the density of the degenerate electrons present in a white dwarf. And this is the relation. With this relation, uh, if we substitute here this relation and uh, we need, uh, because we need the structure of the white dwarf, that is how the white dwarf looks like this mass and radius, we need to solve two equations. One is called the pressure balance equation and one is the mass balance equation. These two equations together are called TOV equation and this can be derived exactly from the Einstein field equation uh, that is capital G mu equal to kappa T mu nu equation. And once we solve these three equations simultaneously, you can see there are uh, three unknown P, M, and rho, and three equations one can solve, and it can be seen. This is the mass radius relation of a white dwarf, and it can be seen the maximum mass is 1.4 solar mass. And in a white dwarf, always mass increases when radius decreases. So this way, the Sandersekhar limit is established. Now in our case, in non-commutative case, we do not have the commutative E square equal to P square C square plus M square C power four. Rather, we have a non-commutative um, disper energy dispersion relation. In that dispersion relation, uh, how the phase space volume element will be modified in uh, whenever there is commutative algebra, the phase space volume basically given by this integration D3P basically given all three momentum, However, now since I have quantized levels, the quantum could all the quantized levels has to be summed up and these things has been modified like this. So accordingly, our pressure and the density has been modified. And this is uh, uh, this will be our new dispersion relation combining these two equations. So how they look like? The Chandrasekhar equation of state is looks like this black card. Now, suppose we assume all the electrons are in the non-commutative geometry, they are in the ground state. That means non-commutative, uh, the strength of non-commutivity is the maximum. In that case, we obtain this uh, new uh, equation of state. If we assume all the electrons are in two states, the ground state and also in the first state, in that case, we obtain this dispersion, uh, this uh, equation of state and so on. And you can see at the low densities, all the equation of state merges with the Chandrasekhar equation of state. So whenever we, um, we say about laboratory experiment in our ordinary system with very low density, none of them will be violated. Only the effect will come at the high density regimes around this much densities always. So in that case, how the mass radius relation would look like, as I have shown, Chandrasekhar showed that the mass, uh, maximum mass is 1.4 solar mass with his equation of state. 
If we use our equation of state, considering let's say all are in the ground level, we obtain that the maximum mass can be 2.6 solar mass. But if we just try to increase more and more number of levels, then the mass limit decreases because the strength of non-commutivity decreases and eventually it becomes more a classical equation of state. And with this, now let's go to the scale of non-commutivity at what scale this can happen. So this is the energy dispersion relation written in slightly different way, such that this is the Compton wavelength of the electron and all others are known. And with this uh, idea, non-commutativity is, will be prominent if this factor is dominant and this factor will be dominant if numerator is greater than the denominator. And from this expression and substituting some other length scale, uh, basically rho, by mp mu will give me the number density, density by mass will give me number density and from number density power one, negative one third will give me the length scale. So the length scale turned out to be the Compton wavelength of the electron divided by a factor. This factor is of the order of one, maybe two or three or something like that. So always the length scale depends on the Compton wavelength of the electron. But uh, generally, we uh, usually believe that uh, our various articles shows that non commutative is prominent only in the Planck regime. That means whenever the Planck length scale appears, non commutativity has to be more prominent. However, what we have obtained that non commutativity will be prominent whenever the length scale is the uh, length scale will be the uh, will be smaller than the Compton wavelength of the electron. Basically, the inter here the length scale will be the interparticle separation. If the interparticle separation is less than this factor, our non-commutivity scale is prominent. And this non-commutivity scale is given by now L into LP squared power one third. And this expression has given by Wigner uh, in 1960s. He shows that not necessarily all the length scale has to be Planck length, rather uh, it has to be kind of superposition of the system's length scale and the Planck's length. And uh, in our case, because this length is uh, compared to this Compton wavelength, our uncertainty length scale should be like this. Now let's look at this expression, how uh, Wigner obtained uh, basically this expression. He gave a thought experiment. So let's say I am sending a light pulse from here to the, uh, from point A to point B. It has a width of delta. Whenever it reaches B, it will have a width uh, this value. And this factor has a minimum. We can see easily this factor has a minimum whenever delta has this value. That means delta has to be always greater than this value. So we obtain delta square is uh, greater than this scale. Again, from general theory of relativity, we know that anything has to be greater than this uh, event horizon radius kind of basically if mass is m, then is delta is gm over c square. So if we just multiply this two expression, we obtain that delta has to be uh, L into LP squared power one third. So our systems, uh, so systems length scale is very important. And in our case, as we have shown, our systems length scale is the uh, Compton length scale of the electron. Had we have gone for neutron star or quark star or boson stars, so accordingly, the systems length scale of those constituent particles would be important. Uh, now, we have shown that, that uh, using this, uh, Using this dispersion relation, we, can, we have seen the violation of the Chandrasekhar limit. Chandrasekhar showed 1.4 solar mass, but we, we, we could have opted 2.6 solar mass with this equation of state. In that sense, is it possible uh, to obtain whether this is correct theory or uh, correct or wrong uh, can be proved from observation? In that case, uh, I'm giving one indirect observation here. Basically, uh, there are lots of supernovas have been observed. And we, as I have shown, supernovas are linked with the mass of the white dwarf. However, some supernovas, at least 15 so far, uh, for last couple of decades, they have extremely high luminosity compared to the standard supernovae. And in that case, actually, there are many papers actually currently, uh, uh, these two, uh, they have uh, predicted the mass of the white dwarf can be 2.1 to 2.8 solar mass. So in that sense, we can say that our non commutative theory might be correct because we have also obtained this high uh, mass limit of the white dwarfs also. However, not only non commutativity but actually there are 50 to 100 different models people have proposed 
to explain this uh, high mass, basically high mass of the quad dot, or basically it showed the Chandrasekhar mass limit. This also includes um, this massive gravity, modified gravity, such as FR gravity, or even the earlier speakers have spoken uh, general uncertainty principle. So they have all, uh, I mean, all these models can predict easily the violation of this Chandrasekhar mass limit. So which theory is the correct? We still do not know because all this prediction has been done indirectly from this luminosity observations. None of such super Chandrasekhar white dots have been observed directly. So in our series of papers, we have proposed that uh, probably uh, futuristic gravitational wave detectors, um, say LISA or DESAIGO, et cetera, they can detect such, uh, det uh, such super Chandrasekhar white dots directly. And once we detect such uh, white dots directly, we can obtain their masses and radius and then we can easily rule out or single out many theories from this uh, zoo of theories, basically. And this comes to my conclusion slide that in the presence of non-commutivity, uh, the fermions behave less like a fermion, and that's why more fermions can be accommodated in a given volume, which implies the ma increase in mass of the, of the mass of the object. And as I've shown, non-commutative behaves like an internally generated magnetic field, like but non-commutative do not have. Uh, the classical effect like the magnetic field has. And in the, this case, I have shown the system's length scale is very important for the prominence of non-commutivity. And in the white dot, it's the Compton wavelength of the electron because white dots constitute of the electron gas. Had it been neutron star or other stars, accordingly, this length scale will be uh, modified uh, to the constituent, uh, constituent particles. And of course, as I have shown, super Chandrasekhar white dots can be formed in the presence of non-commutivity. And probably gravitational wave detector can confirm the existence of non-commutativity once it can detect such white dwarfs uh, in the future. So yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much for a nice, nice talk. And now we have five minutes question time. Please raise your hand if you want to ask something. Yes, Mr. Novak. Yes, so you claim that uh, by Liza, Lisa, we will be able to, uh, I mean, constrain non commutative geometry, right? Or, uh... Yes, sir. Yes. Okay. Yeah, any more questions? Okay, if there are no more questions, thank you very much again. Yeah, and we have uh, five minutes before the start of the talk of Jose Manuel. Hello, Jose Manuel. Very sad. Are you very sad about yesterday? <laughs> okay, a little bit. <laughs> a little bit upset. Well. Wow. <laughs> I'm I'm really sorry. It would be nice if both of you could go could mm -hmm. go farther, but unfortunately. But it was nice. It was a, a nice match. Yeah, I think it was really. It was a nice game indeed. Yes. Yeah. All right. Okay. So so we have still four minutes. So you can try to share your screen. Yes. And, yes, I will try. It. Uh, and since the since there is uh, there was no announcement of your talk, uh, you will. Mm -hmm. uh, I hope you will tell us. Yes. Uh, uh, give you a short summary to start with, so that people know about what you're gonna, what you're gonna talk about. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, we still have we still have a couple of moments, so uh, this, since there might be some people switching from yeah. another sec uh, sessions, I would okay. like to to just wait for this three mm -hmm. or four minutes. Yeah, very good. More. Yes so that you start exactly on time. Okay. Uh, how much time do I have? Uh, uh, look, you have the standard, if I remember correctly, yes, you have, uh, uh, well, you have, uh, you have 15 minutes, that's exactly what you requested, but you can extend it slightly because we, we are a little bit, we, we don't, uh, 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 you know, we are not really very squeezed this time. So, so, so if you want to extend it for, for five minutes more, it's okay. 25 minutes would be okay or? Uh, uh, 
It's All right. Much. Okay. Let, let's make. It, let's do it. So twenty-five minutes will be okay, including okay. question time, which means that okay. if you start in three minutes, uh, mm -hmm. I will ask you to go to conclusions five minutes to twelve. Okay. okay. Mm -hmm. Very good. Okay, Jose Manuel, it's still one minute to uh, to your time, but I think there's nobody's gonna uh, nobody's gonna join us who is not already there. So please start. Okay, very good. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jurek. Thank you very much uh, to to you and to Giovanni for organizing these these sessions. Uh, my talk uh, is going to have two parts. Uh, I'm going to, to present uh, the cost action uh, CA18108. And then I will turn uh, a little bit on physics, in particular, physics of the universe transparency in a deformed uh, kinematics. So uh, the cost action is, is a network for cooperation in a certain topic. No? In, in particular, this action concerns quantum gravity phenomenology in the multi-messenger approach. The start date of this action was in March uh, 2019, and uh, it will last for four years. So in principle, the, the end date would be in uh, March 23. So we have uh, almost two years more of the action. Well, the main aim here was to investigate the possible signatures predicted by quantum gravity models in the observation of different cosmic messengers by creating the conditions for a close collaboration between theorists and the various experimental communities involved in the detection of such cosmic messengers. So the keywords here were uh, gamma ray astronomy, cosmic neutrinos, ultra high energy cosmic rays and gravitational waves, that is these cosmic messengers, and a very important topic, the Lorentz infinite relation and the formation. So you see here the key point to address the challenge is just to, to join these different communities, uh, experimental and theoretical communities. Uh, this is our network. At, at present, uh, there are 28 cost uh, member countries. Uh, these are divided in what is called uh, inclusiveness target countries, uh, ITC cost members, which are essentially uh, countries from the east of Europe and Portugal. We have 15 non-ITC cost members here and two near neighbors countries. And apart from this, we have uh, 10 international partner countries, which are uh, at present Canada, uh, Chile, China, Japan, USA, Kuwait, uh, Iran, Mexico, Argentina, and Brazil. Um, the coordination of this, uh, of this uh, network is done through uh, six different working groups. Working group one is mainly the theoretical uh, working group. And then there is a phenomenology a working group which establishes the, the link between working group one and the rest of the working group, which are uh, devoted to each of the cosmic messengers. And apart from this, we have a number of committees, advisory uh, committees for training school and annual conferences for outreach and general activities, for the evaluation of uh, what is called uh, short-term uh, uh, stays, no, admissions, and committee for evaluation of ITC conference grants. Well, here you, you can see the, the core group uh, with uh, Giovanni Ambrino Camellia as the action vice chair, Manel Martinez, the grant holder, scientific representative, uh, Marian Tortola, science communication manager, 
Diana Dominis Prester, SDSM coordinator, and Julian Bormont, the ITC coordinator, uh, conference grant manager. And we have uh, different uh, leaders and vice leaders for each of these uh, working groups. Uh, we have a number of information channels. We have a website, uh, Facebook, uh, Twitter, uh, Instagram accounts, and also a, a Telegram uh, channel specifically devoted to, to these uh, topics. So uh, we have a very active uh, social uh, activities. Uh, well, which are the, the main um, tools, network tools in, in cost action? Uh, there are the short-term scientific missions that allow some researchers go uh, to, to uh, make some short stays in other, in other uh, institutions. We have also uh, conference grants for uh, PhD uh, students and uh, early postdocs from ITC uh, countries. We have training schools and meetings. Uh, our two uh, large meetings at the moment have been at Barcelona in 2019 and Granada uh, just when the uh, coronavirus uh, outbreak uh, happened. So. Um, apart from this, we have some outreach and diversity activities with uh, a number of initiatives that you can see in, in our website. And uh, during the last months, our big project has been a review on quantum gravity phenomenology that should be completed in just in uh, two or three months. To request to any interaction, please complete the form that you can find in our web page. And for any doubt or question, just send me an email. Uh, I want to, to advertise here our first training school that is going to take place uh, in principle face to face, but also in a hybrid format in Corfu in uh, the end of the September and beginning of October this year. And uh, at the second annual conference that we will have uh, just after this. Uh, we have a, a, a very, I think, a very good panel of lecturers here, Jose Ignacio Llana, Tomás Uberigo, Renate Lol, Gianluca Calcagni, Mauricio Espurio, Elisa Prandini, Denise Boncioli, Marian Tortola, and Yuri Kowalski-Klickman. Eh, Kowalski so uh, I encourage your students to, to apply for this uh, training school. OK, I, I just want to say here that this is going to be the first training school of a complete series of three uh, training schools during our cost action. And each of them, well, this, this is going to be the, the basic training uh, school. And uh, each of them is going to, to build on the previous one with more advanced topics. Uh, we, ha we have had also uh, recently some online workshops and discussion sessions. For example, in December 2020, we had a workshop commemorating the, the 20th uh, anniversary of uh, DSR theories. And in fact, uh, the Lorentz evaluation and W special relativity theories are one of the main topics of discussion in our network. You know, the, the main difference is uh, simply the, the existence or not of a relativistic principle in the theory. So this is one of the main topics of discussion, and I'm going to talk uh, about this. Uh, we also had um, uh, just a, a weeks, a few weeks ago, a discussion session on the very exciting uh, latest uh, results from the LASSO collaboration that has uh, announced the, the observation of a very high energy photons at the PF scale coming from sources uh, in, in, our, in our galaxy. So these are uh, what is are called pevatrons no? in, in our galaxy. So this opens a new, a new window of observation of, for this specific messenger, which is uh, gamma rays. And uh, well, here uh, propagation effects will, be, will become very relevant in the observation of, uh, of this messenger. So uh, one of the important topics of discussion would be the transparency of the universe. Uh, and it's possible modification from the special relativistic case in the scenarios of Lorentz evaluation and DSR. And this is what I'm going to, to talk now, no? coming a little bit on physics. Uh, the physics of the universe transparency in a deformed kinematics. So uh, this is uh, our group. Uh, this has been done in collaboration with Jose Luis Cortés and uh, Jose Javier Lancio, and also these students from the University of Zaragoza, Lucia Pereira, Michael Reyes, and Ángel Ricoira. Uh, I'm going to, to divide this short talk in just three parts. Uh, I'm, first, I'm going to, to explain what I understand by a relativistic deformed kinematics. Then I will go to a specific example, which is the threshold of pair production and the difference in the scenario with a principle of relativity and without a principle of relativity. 
And then I will go to, to a full calculation of uh, the modification of the mean free path of uh, photons in a relativistic deformed kinematics. This, uh, this is taken from uh, a previous work on symmetry journal and also work in preparation. So uh, relativistic deformed kinematics. Uh, just consider the scattering of two particles into two particles, uh, which are the ingredients of this uh, kinematics. Well, in special relativity, we have uh, conservation law, uh, which expresses as, as the sum of the momenta of the uh, initial state is uh, equal to the sum of the momenta of the final state. And we have the dispersion relations for each of the particles. So these are the two ingredients. And apart from this, we have an invariance under linear Lorentz transformations. So what is a deformed kinematics? In a deformed kinematics, we, uh, in principle, we deform both ingredients. The uh, linear sum is uh, modified um, with a, a modified composition law. And the dispersion relation is also modified to a modified dispersion relation. Both modifications depend on a new scale, a high energy scale, lambda. And the word deformed here means that simply that the special relativity is obtained in the limit when lambda goes to infinity. This is deformed. What is relativistic here? Relativistic means that we have a relativistic invariance under uh, deformed, lambda deformed Lorentz transformations in the two particle system. So uh, we have new Lorentz transformations and these uh, quantities change, but uh, we, still have, uh, we still have these, these ingredients. So this is relativistic. I'm going to give you an example, an example which is at first order, yes, at the end. That, that means uh, where the, the modified dispersion relation and modified composition law only contains uh, terms of one over lambda. Uh, this is supposed to be uh, just a first order approximation um, towards an all order um, RDK. And one can build a very generic uh, form of the dispersion relation of the composition law, just considering that uh, rotational invariance is implemented linearly. And we have here a number of uh, coefficients, alpha 1 and alpha 2, for the modified dispersion relation. And these four coefficients, beta 1, beta 2, and gamma 1, gamma 2, for the composition, the, 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 the zero component of the composition of momenta, and the spatial components of the composition uh, of momenta here. Now, in principle, this is just a deformation of the kinematics. In, in, in a non-relativistic deformation, uh, well, one usually takes these coefficients beta uh, and gamma equal to zero. That is, in Lorentz invariant relation, one only considers just a deformation of the modified dispersion relation. But it is no longer the case if we want to maintain a relativity principle, because uh, in a relativity principle, we need all these coefficients. In fact, the relativity principle imposes a constraint or two constraints um, between these uh, coefficients that you can see uh, here. This is a generation of the golden rule, which was derived uh, firstly by, uh, by Giovanni Amino Camellia. And uh, these golden rules make that the kinematics of the relativistic invariance and the non-invariance cases is very different. I'm going to show this with a uh, specific example of the calculation of the threshold of pair production in both uh, cases. So the physical process I'm going to consider is a very high energy uh, photon of energy E which interacts in a photon background. This photon background uh, can be the extragalactic extra background light or the, the cosmic microwave background. That is photons with a very low energy, uh, epsilon, and produce uh, the, uh, a, photo, uh, a pair uh, electron positron. No? So this, this relation has a threshold in special relativity. Uh, if one consider that the epsilon is, is fixed, uh, this reaction is only possible when the high energy uh, photon has an energy higher than this quantity, the electron mass squared divided by epsilon. So uh, this equation, this threshold is modified when one goes to a deformed kinematics. And when one introduces this modified dispersion relation, a modified composition law, the, the equation of threshold of special relativity, which would be just simply these terms, get uh, extra terms. The uh, dominant term is this one, which is of the order uh, E cubed uh, divided by lambda. And there are also some subdominant terms here. So in the case of the uh, non-relativistic case, that is Lorentz invariant relation, one just consider that uh, gamma, uh, gamma and beta are all equal to zero and just consider some modification of the dispersion relation. That is only here alpha one plus alpha two. And one can compute, well, one forgets about this term, and one can compute very easily 
uh, an approximation for the for the threshold in this case. And the threshold, well, one can see that it is here, that uh, if we introduced an effective uh, uh, cut of lambda that takes into account these coefficients, numerical coefficients alpha 1, alpha 2, 1, 8, but it's of this order. No? What happens in the, in the relativistic case? In the relativistic case, we have the golden rules. And the golden rule exactly told me, these golden rules, that this coefficient here is exactly zero. So this means that the dominant correction into the threshold reaction disappears. And then one has to go to the subdominant corrections here. And one can compute, which is the, the threshold in this, in this case. Uh, the calculation is this one. And you can see this is the final expression. You can see the difference here between the Lorentz invariant evaluation case and the relativistic case. We have here in the Lorentz invariant evaluation case an amplification factor because this uh, factor, the electron mass squared divided by the energy of the photon background uh, uh, squared, is a very large factor. So this means that the, uh, the threshold, the modification of the threshold, which is this quantity that adds to one, is very large in the case of uh, Lorentz invariant evaluation, but is much more mild in the case of relativistic uh, principle. So just to take some numbers, if you put here uh, the energy of the CMB, for example, and you allow for a 10% correction uh, with respect to the, to the special relativistic case, the bound on, on lambda would be of the order of the Planck mass in the case of the Lorentz invariant evaluation, but it would be of the order just of the PEV in the case of the relativistic deformation uh, kinematics. So this is something general. No? In the case of uh, a relativity, when relativity principle is, is present, the modification is much milder. But then you see that uh, we are here in this scale, which is just uh, the scale that we are opening right now. No? And uh, to obtain this, I have derived or I have considered just a first order approximation of an RDK. So if I want to, to explore what happens at, the, at this scale, the PA, uh, this first order approximation does no longer is um, useful. No? So one would need to, to go to an all order uh, RDK. And this is what I'm going to do in, the, in this uh, third part. I'm going to, to calculate how the mean free path of photons uh, are modified in a full relativistic de uh, deformed kinematics scenario. So first I'm going to uh, to consider what happens in a special relativity. In special relativity, one can co compute the photon mean free path through this uh, formula, where here this, you have an integral over the angle uh, which form the high energy photon and the low energy photon, and also an integral uh, where here uh, we have here the, the uh, photon, the density of the background and the cross section. Uh, in between the two photons. And the integral is done here over all energies of the photon background. Uh, the energy epsilon now starts in a threshold because if one consider uh, now that the energy of the high energy photon is fixed, then this, uh, this process of per reaction can only happen for a certain uh, threshold or in the energy of the photon background, no? for energies before, low, uh, higher than that. Uh, so this is the standard formula, special relativity. In fact, in special relativity, relativity one can use the uh, S invariant, which has uh, this very easy uh, form. And one can uh, make a change of variables here and uh, express the two integrals over S, over the relativistic invariant quantity, and over um, epsilon here. So the result is this one. I've taken this, this figure from this uh, reference, and you can hear well, uh, how is the, this uh, mean free path in special relativity with three different uh, um, backgrounds? Here we have the extragalactic background. Uh, we have here this uh, uh, curve is the, the cosmic microwave background. And here we have the radio background, which dominates our very, very high energies. So uh, the thing I want to notice here is that uh, for photons between uh, 0.1 PV and 10 to the 4 PV in, in this zone here, the, the background which is relevant is the CMB. This is the one that becomes dominant. So I'm going to see how this is modified in, in the case of the CMB for a specific relativistic deformed kinematics. And the relativistic deformed kinematics that I'm going to consider uh, is what is called DS, DSL1, which is just uh, the case in which uh, the modified composition law contains only terms uh, which are uh, proportional to one over lambda. Uh, one can construct this relativistic uh, kinematics. This is the total energy of the two photons, and this is the total the momentum of the two photons. We have here 
what is called two different channels uh, because one can compose the 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 a momenta in two different uh, orderings. No? Uh, this is a non-commutative uh, composition law. And one can com uh, compute also which is the modified dispersion relation, which is this one. This one that in the case uh, you see, if uh, the uh, in the case of photons, this is just simply the, the same as in special relativity. So uh, with this uh, modified dispersion relation, one, one can compute the deformation of the relativistic invariant S, which is uh, this one, we have two channels, and it is this one divided by this quantity, but this quantity, in fact, epsilon over lambda is very small, and this is just the standard uh, relativistic component of special relativity. In the second channel, however, uh, it is different from the one of the special relativity, but it is very similar to, the, to, one, to this of a special relativity, just considering here a new energy E prime, which is this one. And then if we make the simple hypothesis that the cross section for the deformed relativistic invariants is just the one of a special relativity changing the, the relativistic invariant by the new one, then one can compute everything. And uh, this is what we have done. So, so we have here the, uh, the new uh, mean free path. Uh, that is a sum of two contributions because we have two different channels. The first one is just uh, the, the standard mean field graph of special relativity. And the second sum is the same that uh, the one in special relativity, but for a different energy, which is uh, this thing. And this trick allows uh, to, co to compute very easily, which is the mean free path in this deformed kinematics. Uh, so you can see here- This was a manual, you have yes. a couple of minutes left. Okay, so uh, this is the course for special relativity. Uh, and this is different curves for different values of uh, lambda, this is k, which is given in terms of this uh, E0, which is the minimum of uh, the mean free path in special relativity, which is around 2 PV. So uh, you see here that uh, the curves, uh, there are curves that are similar to this special relativity, but uh, when, uh, when the cutoff lambda is uh, near E0, these are rather different. I've made here uh, a zoom over uh, in, in this zone. And you see, for uh, values of lambda close to E0. And you have that this is distinguishable. And this can be distinguishable for uh, photons of, for example, 10 PV or so. No? So uh, this is an example uh, of a Ardica phenomenology. This interesting result indicates that uh, a, a relativistic deformed kinematics with a high scale of the other DPV is testable in the new phenomenology window opened with the observation of high energy photons at the PV scale. Uh, the relativistic deformed kinematics could then be distinguished from a situation of lowness infinite violation because it gives definite predictions. Now, you see this, the high energy scale of the deformed kinematics uh, that we are considering is much lower than the Planck, energy, uh, the Planck mass, no? which would be the naive scale associated with, with quantum gravity phenomenology. But uh, first, there are many scenarios, for example, large extra dimensions where this is a sound possibility. And second, this may be compatible with photon time delay and other kinematic constraints. As I said, for example, the photons, uh, the relation, dispersion ratio for photons would be the same as in spatial relativity in, in, the, in the scenario we have considered. So finally, this is an example of the interest of a relativistic deformed kinematics phenomenology that could be complementary to a Lorentz invariant relation phenomenology. So that's all. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Yeah, thank you, Jose Manuel. Uh, Giovanni has a question. Ciao, Jose Manuel. Very nice talk. Uh, we should have uh, a Zoom meeting on this so that we compare ideas. Because I'm also thinking in a different direction, but I'm thinking on the same issues. Uh, re-energized by the LASO data, which are quite relevant for what you just told us. Uh, my simple uh, point, which I would like to get your feedback on is uh, the assumption that the cross-section would not change is actually, uh, in my view, a very strong assumption because mm -hmm. the in special relativity, in special relativistic, uh, say, interactions, in special relativistic setup are described by a quantum field theory. Mm -hmm. And the form of the cross section uh, knows about thresholds much more than uh, where the process is allowed and when it's not. 
For example, in the specific case of uh, gamma gamma going to plus C minus, which you described, it is not just that it starts at the threshold, but it starts with a very specific smooth onset of uh, the cross section starts very small. So in some sense, if you just shift the threshold and keep the cross section unchanged, you might give it a, a, a easily, you might, I mean, it's in my mind is 100% sure that you will not get the relativistic picture, an exact relativistic picture. Now, the question of course, as phenomenologist is not whether it's exact, but whether you miss uh, something big enough to affect your analysis. And I think this we don't know right now. Yeah, yeah, okay, thank you, uh, Giovanni. Yes, this is a very interesting point. In fact, in Lorentz invariant violation studies, this is what they do. They just change, for example, the, the threshold, but they leave the, the cross-section uh, unchanged. But in this case, well, uh, the cross-section is changed in, in, in the following sense. Uh, it is relativistic because what we do, uh, the cross-section is a function of the relativistic invariant S. So the most simple modification to, to have a, a, an invariant cross-section is just to, to have the same expression as in a special relativity, but uh, with a change of the relativistic invariants in special relativity with a new invariant in the, in the modified kinematics. So uh, by construction, this is relativistic invariant. It is true that this is the, the, simple, the simple case one could consider, and perhaps, yes, one could consider other, other uh, examples. But by construction, in, at least, uh, it, it is invariant, no? Well, uh, it's, surely, it's surely worth exploring. I'm just saying that once you have a full theory built on that relativistic invariant picture, it mm -hmm. might affect also the form, not only the dependence. Yes, yes, of course. You know, it, yeah, yeah. It's, it's very easy mm -hmm. to imagine, and probably I would bet it does. But surely mm -hmm. your study motivates us to uh, finally manage mm -hmm. to have uh, deformed theories good enough to compute these cross sections. As you know, I'm asking because after mm -hmm. 20 years, we still yeah. don't have a good way to compute cross sections. Exactly. So it's really, yes. we are going, your mm -hmm. analysis is fishing into a black box, yeah. but showing mm -hmm. us that that black box is even more mm -hmm. important and, and we should double our efforts to yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, fill the blank. Thank you. I completely agree. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. Uh, I think that we are running out of time. So thank you very much, Jose Manuel. Okay, thanks. And uh, now we turn to our last uh, part of the session, the last talk by Giovanni Amelino Camellia, who is a co-organizer. So they, uh, I'm not really sure what Giovanni wants to say today, but I, I, I think a part of it should be uh, should be somehow kind of a summary of our session. So the floor is yours, Giovanni. Thank you, thank you, Yurek. I try to share some little slides that I prepared. I'm not really, uh, in the end I decided not to really offer a summary of, 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 the, of the session, but rather uh, to offer some remarks of my personal perspective on this field, which are motivated also by what we saw in this uh, very nice session. And, uh, but they are of broader, I think, uh, of broader significance. Uh, first, first, let me start on a, on a lighter note. Uh, well, the, first of all, is is light, but is a big celebration. I mean, this field did not exist, and if you read reviews from the early 1990s, there, there were still very strong claims that it could never exist, the phenomenology of quantum gravity. And the, the Marcel Grossman is among uh, now several things that marked very clearly this change of uh, perspective and folklore and. Uh, and um, the quantum gravity phenomenology session has been a, a steady and busy uh, fixture for the Marcel Grossman since 2006 edition. Uh, so this was, uh, uh, in those days were the first things that gave encouragement to me 
like the PAX number that now exists for 15 years or so for uh, quantum gravity phenomenology and, and all those sort of things that told me that this field really was coming into existence. I, as an Italian, I'm also uh, now uh, very superstitious about the Marcel Grossman in particular, because uh, every time there is the Marcel Grossman on a year when there is a major soccer competition, if Italy attends, goes to the final. This is now, I have no theory, but it's a very strong correlation in data. And uh, I'm happy that yesterday Italy went to the final, even though Italy was pretty lucky because Spain played a very nice game. And, uh, and uh, And uh, one final comment on this particular uh, list of uh, MG sessions. Uh, I, I, this one for this year, we really must uh, thank and give credit to Jurek. I, 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 I am uh, presently, I knew that I would be this summer overwhelmed with the professional tasks, committees, selection committees, committees of every sort. And I was uh, kind of giving up on the idea of uh, having the session, this uh, Marcel Gross one, but then uh, Eurek Energy made it become a reality and it was such a successful meeting, meeting and I, I'm very grateful for Eurek's energy. Now moving to the more, uh, what I consider the most serious part, you'll tell me then if it's true of my remarks. Uh, so this phenomenology exists, as this session proved once again, uh, we, we should be well aware that is, uh, um, it is true phenomenology with data meaningfully compared to theories, but it still is a peculiar phenomenology because uh, quantum gravity at present, I write emphatically could be anything, but you know, we really don't know what quantum gravity could be. Um, we have no idea whether the theories we have played with so far in the physics community have even anything marginally relevant for the quantum gravity problem. And, and so the, the difference from other phenomenology is that the uh, number of scenarios, which in principle you could uh, probe, you might want to desire to probe is huge. Uh, one uh, particular advantage, however, is that we have, we hope to have, we cannot be sure even on that, but we have strong hints that a scale roughly of the order of the Planck scale is characteristic of the effect. So that's why when I promote phenomenology of quantum gravity, I always stress the point that if we don't have a good case for the testability of effects at the Planck scale, considering how wide the range of things we should test, uh, for example, those experiments couldn't be funded right now. We, we should give priority in this vast phenomenology to those proposals which at least show promise to reach Planck scale sensitivity. And uh, there are the, the, the one part of phenomenology that was most discussed at this meeting and is uh, uh, it's always this way because it's the one with the more abundance of data and ideas also is, um, as we heard also in the last talk, it concerns the fate of relativistic symmetries at the Planck scale. And, and there we clearly have, uh, is, the more, is the clearest case of having really within reach Planck scale sensitivity. And uh, I repeat, this appeared to be impossible to most authors in the early 1990s, but now it's clearly a reality. And I also want to stress that while these studies about the fate of relativistic symmetry at the Planck scale, they are the clearest, uh, most uh, vital uh, aspect of this phenomenology. This phenomenology is very uh, large. And uh, I am in charge of the leading review of the field uh, which I try to update every now and then, but you will see in this review a long list of quantum gravity phenomenology proposals, also some of which have nothing to do with the fate of relativistic symmetries at the Planck scale. So 
I'm anxious to see the community appreciate that the scope of this phenomenology is broader. But, the, but instead, I will stick to the fate of these images at the Planck scale, which was uh, for me conceptually at first, before the phenomenological aspects, already as a PhD student, was something that really fascinated me. And I would have a long list of PhD student questions I had in mind when I was a PhD student, but one that is worth stressing now so that younger participants know how old I am. Uh, in my PhD days, my PhD studies days, still uh, senior scientists, I would go to a conference and there would be some senior scientists without any hesitation and without any concern for the implications that would say the Planck land is the minimum of low value for wavelengths. And uh, I was impressed. I mean, these were very famous physicists making this claim over and over. And uh, I thought, but why, why come nobody comments on the relativistic implications? Because of course, if the Planck length is the minimum wavelength for one observer, if you then leave relativistic transformations as changed, uh, that will not be true for a boosted observer for whom the minimum allowed for wavelengths would be smaller. So that's where it came from for me. Uh, luckily, in the following years, so the second part of the 1990s, uh, 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 several results started to hint that something was interesting about the fate of Lorentz symmetry at the Planck scale. And, and this is also where shortly after, starting in 2000, these uh, two sides that uh, Jose Manuel stressed, the leave side, the case of broken relativistic invariance and the DSR side, the case of deformed relativistic invariance started to uh, came into, come into play. Of course, the uh, deformed relativistic invariance is a smoother way to affect our current theories, but it's technically more challenging because you need to change the laws of transformation between observers in such a way to keep invariant the new laws. The leave scenarios are simpler because they don't have any uh, burden of proof in some sense. You're simply losing the symmetry you had, uh, but they are simpler and, uh, and, and many more results are more easily obtained. Uh, in, in my way to do phenomenology, those of you who know me, they know that I, uh, as a, on the conceptual side, I am most intrigued by the deformation of relativistic symmetry, but as a phenomenologist, I'm not just looking at the two possibilities on the, on the same level. I mean, nature will decide, of course, not me. Uh, let me quickly go through this slide, which I'm using at several meetings, because also on the deformed relativistic side, I, uh, I am happy that so many developments arise uh, and I want to stress some things that could be done more. One thing which is not on this slide because everybody in, this, in, in that field knows for the deformed relativistic uh, symmetry scenario, uh, we need interacting theories so that we can compute those cross sections that, uh, for example, in the analysis by Jose Manuel are needed. Uh, we are probably getting closer because some uh, theoretical tools that might be needed for that objective have uh, come into the picture. That is the, all the, the whole relative locality development with curved momentum spaces, which provided a set of theories that can be uh, used uh, to construct DSR relativistic symmetries uh, systematically. Uh, and uh, much progress has been made in understanding uh, how. Um, there is a subtle point of when momentum space is a, a group manifold, then we can rely on the mathematics of off algebras. And, and, and that's the one side in, in this relativistic theory which has been more studied and with more progress. Um, two things which I'm not, so these were two things that I'm happy, the developments have been strong. Uh, I wish uh, there was a more, on uh, uh, the dual case, instead of group manifold, when you have a group manifold as momentum space, then you get a composition law of momenta, which is associative, but non-commutative, as you saw in, uh, in the talk by Jose Manuel. Uh, 
uh, I, I feel it would be important to study the dual case, which is also perfectly viable, where instead the log composition momenta is commutative but not associative. And on this, we, we don't have the equally strong support for mathematics and progress has been uh, slowly coming. Also, I'd like to see uh, more uh, efforts to see how to construct PSR scenarios in, uh, in, in some areas of research in quantum gravity where I'm confident that one can do it. Uh, these are uh, the areas that I would call the von Dijsselbloem principle and GUP, if you know what I'm talking about, the area of generalized Niner space times, the Pinsler geometry. There's a whole bunch of ideas, geometrical ideas mainly for space, for phase space or for space time, where the DSR perspective could be valuable and has not been uh, studied much. Uh, In uh, the, the main implication, and this is also connected to Jose Manuel's talk, the main opportunities for phenomenology in these lead DSR situations are in vacuo dispersions, which are studies of uh, essentially the speed of travel of particles, and threshold anomalies, which are studies of the type Jose Manuel talked when, when you study the threshold for certain particle reactions. And uh, they, it's interesting that by combining, if we ever had, we don't now, but if we ever had good results on both, we could also compare the leave and the DSR scenario pretty uh, effectively. Uh, the phenomenology for invago dispersion is growing. At first, it was only photons. Now starts to be also phenomenology with neutrinos. As far as we can say, within the limits of how much we understand the DSR theories, in vacuo dispersion is possible in both cases. And uh, what's, and in particular, the leaf scenario, when the broken uh, relativistic invariants, many authors, I will comment that I, I'm not sure this is a good idea, but many authors assume that this should be implemented in effective field theory setup. If you do, I mean, uh, uh, which is legitimate. Uh, I just, uh, I'm surprised about how many people assume you should do it, but it's certainly legitimate to explore that possibility. Then at lowest order, the vacuo dispersion switches sign. If instead you have no reason to expect in the SR. So there are some distinctive features already in vacuo dispersion. For the threshold anomaly, uh, the main phenomenology is about the, as, as Jose Manuel actually stressed very nicely, is about the opacity of the universe to gamma rays, which is what Jose Manuel talked about, and also for the cosmic ray spectrum, <clears throat> where thresholds for particle reactions play a key role. Uh, with the breaking of relativistic symmetries, you very quickly get to threshold anomalies. With DSR, you see I've written not possible in quotes because it's, um, it, that is, it's, it's, it's strongly protected. The, the, the relativistic invariant strongly protects against threshold anomalies. This is one of the reasons to leading order. Of course, there are already all the results of mine that have been confirmed by other studies that to leading order, you, you cannot have it. <clears throat> uh, now, mm, it's very interesting that Jose Manuel and collaborators are pushing this to the level of the cross sections where we don't have control. It's plausible. But I mean, as we stand now, we see threshold anomalies are mainly uh, a manifestation of possible lead, most likely in, just in reflection of our present understanding of the, which might evolve, of course, but at present suggests threshold anomalies has been more characteristic of the leaf case. <clears throat> and uh, again, it's interesting if you have uh, broken relativistic invariance within an effective field theory setup, then at lowest order, you would have the two sides for the two polarizations. And, and you would have <clears throat> that for some polarization, the, the opacity of the universe increases 
whereas for the other polarization it decreases. And this is actually quite interesting. I mean, I, this is the scenario that I least like is if I had taste, I'm a scientist, so I cannot have taste. But if I was allowed to have taste, I would say Lorentz invariance violation in effective field theory is the, the one scenario that I least like among all these. But instead, as a phenomenologist and as a scientist, I should say that the present data situation surely <clears throat> is pretty exciting, in particular for this, uh, for this scenario, for all of them, but in particular for this one. And I'm thinking of this recent uh, laser uh, Pevatron results, which also Jose Manuel mentioned, which uh, clearly was start together with other, there are the, 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 the Pevatron, as Jose Manuel clearly stressed, should have as background for opacity the CMB photons. And uh, it's not conclusive, but surely, surely the laser data, laser data point to a lower opacity than we would have naively expected. So one possible explanation clearly could be something funny with the relativistic invariance. Um, and we have a similar situation for the infrared background of photons, which also Jose Manuel mentioned there. It's uh, mainly a target for uh, photons of a few tens of TVs, much lower energies, but also there, the situation about the opacity of the universe is uh, still uh, not fully conclusive, but increasingly one could claim that the opacity we find in data is uh, less than we would expect theoretically with ordinary relativistic invariance. And uh, the final remark of perspective is, uh, is this one on effective field theory. Um, I repeat, I, I am a scientist. I have no religion, uh, at least when I work. And uh, so uh, I am perfectly happy and very interested in studies of quantum gravity phenomenology that use the effective field theory setup. Uh, they may well be the one that lead us to a big discovery. I, I, I really mean that. But what I think is discomforting for me is that still there is a large community that is just cannot see past the effective field theory paradigm. Uh, this is typical because when something is a paradigm, when it has been there for generations of physicists, it's difficult to break free. But indeed, we have to recognize them, these paradigms that get imposed by a certain plateau in our understanding of physics. And, and, and think about, surely, if we have a revolutionary phase for physics, like quantum gravity, we all expect to be, surely some of these paradigms will disappear. They, they, they are called paradigms because they work really well when we are in a plateau of our growth of knowledge in, in science, and they go away, some of them, not all of them, the FT paradigm might survive the quantum gravity revolution, which I'm expecting, but uh, it appears that some colleagues just cannot imagine the FT paradigm going away, whereas instead it's one of the good candidates for the typical thing that when you have a new revolutionary phase in physics, uh, several paradigms, disappear like absolute time and like classical mechanics and all these sort of old fashioned uh, stupid things. And so let me spend my last words to uh, give you a, a, a challenge to those who are uh, devote. It's really devotion in some physicists. Uh, the one toward the effective field theory. They just say, well, for 50 years, every new physics could always be introduced as an extra term in effective field theory. Why can't we do it for quantum gravity? Well, for 50 years, what you call new physics was not really new. To have a new particle or, 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 or a new interaction is not really new physics. It's another thing in the old physics setup. Quantum gravity is not going to be like that. That's uh, something I'm ready to bet at least $1. <clears throat> And so my challenge is for the uh, devotes to effective theory to find a single example of a quantum space time, of a theory in a quantum space time where you can prove 
that effective field theory applies. And you will find none. What some uh, devotees might mention is the case of space-time non-commutativity, but actually only the simplest space-time non-commutativity, the canonical non-commutativity, where there are works on effective field theory, but is uh, what we should be realizing is that these works are really, <clears throat> in some sense, forcing the effective field theory uh, paradigm on a formalism which is not really happy with it, at least to the extent that we have uh, ultra-valid infrared mixing. And to say that I have a normal effective field theory setup, but I have infrared and mixing is one of the funniest sentences that I've heard. If you have infrared and mixing, you clearly are not in a standard effective field theory setup. And the theory is telling you, please don't do effective field theory because there is IR in remixing. And finally, the form relativistic symmetries is very easy to see that they cannot be implemented in a standard effective field theory setup. And these are just coming from a space-time non-commutativity, but for example, IRUV mixing, I claim is, a, and I'm not alone, is a pervasive, is one of the most solid expectations we have about quantum gravity. We find it explicitly in some models, but <clears throat> the expectation for it has roots in, in, at a much model independent level, at least to the, for example, to the extent that the bekenstein hawking entropy law uh, is a, a, a largely model independent uh, hypothesis. Uh, and, and if you think about it, the Bekenstein Hawking entropy law implies IR mixing because it's, it's a UV uh, story which ends up screwing up the relation between entropy and area. But the relation between entropy and area is more and more significant. So the, I mean, it screws up the relation between entropy and volume. It becomes a relation between entropy and area, but how much we are affecting physics? We are affecting it much more strongly in the infrared because the difference in growth, in growing with volume, between growing with volume and growing with area, of course, is more significant the bigger the scales. So the, the bekenstein hawking entropy catastrophe is a, primarily an infrared catastrophe, even though it comes from ultraviolet uh, seeds of the phenomenon. So <clears throat> IR UV mixing is probably a very general expectation which we should consider. And if you have IR UV mixing, you should stop saying that, uh, well, I have a standard effective field theory setup, but I have IR UV mixing. That, that simply means you don't have a standard effective field theory setup. And on this, I stop with my old guy complain. Thank you. Thanks, Giovanni, for your wonderful talk. And uh, we still have a few minutes for questions before we officially close our session. Are there any questions? Yes, Jose Manuel. Hello. Many thanks, Giovanni, for this very, very nice talk. Uh, I would like to ask you, uh, well, as you have mentioned, the relativistic uh, theories, uh, well, this uh, forbids uh, uh, some anomalies, you know, threshold anomalies, because they are much more difficult, no? Uh, well, the, the thing is because the scale, of course. Uh, in, in, in my talk, for example, I, I was considering a high energy scale of the order of PV instead of the, the Planck mass scale. No? That, that's uh, really the, the point. Uh, what do you think of um, considering, I mean, um, considering, yes, that the possibility that uh, perhaps we were too naive thinking on, on the Planck mass as the, as the quantum gravity uh, scale, Perhaps also motivated for this um, reason you were you were telling now about this infrared ultraviolet mixing that perhaps makes the situation more complicated, no? And perhaps the, the possibility that we may find a surprise like this that the, the existence of, of a high energy scale, which is not of the order of Planck mass, but uh, of the Planck mass, but much lower, and then we can have some reflect of uh, of a deformation uh, of a relativistic deformation of uh, kinematics. Thank you, Jose Manuel. No, I agree completely. Uh, um, I stressed it already 
while uh, in some sense, I think uh, priority, I, I stress that priority, if I have to support of, of uh, you know, uh, give my uh, letter of support to an experiment uh, looking for funding, if it is quantum gravity phenomenology, but it does not have the potential of looking for the plant scale sensitivity, uh, right now I will not give it high priority because there's so many things out there that we could do and at least let us focus on those who have uh, that potential. On the other hand, this is uh, what you stress, I also completely agree. Uh, when you have an experimental situation, like probably the LASO data, together with the other data I mentioned on the um, um, far infrared background, cosmological background, opacity. Um, at some point, and, and in that direction where your talk was aimed, we are getting very close to have a, a clear experimental crisis. Mm -hmm. Now then, uh, then, then you see each, because most quantum gravity phenomenology does not have a clear experimental crisis, is exploration. And if I have to give my letter of support to a proposal of a telescope or another experiment, which will do this exploration, but without even plant scale sensitivity, uh, then I will not give my support. Just not that I, I mean, maybe they will get lucky, not that I know, but I have to give priority to other things for exploration. Now what you're talking is a very, important addition to my talk, there is another situation which we can hope. And that probably with the lasso data, we are getting close, not really there, but now is really within reach that for the first time, this community will face a true experimental crisis. Something really doesn't work. And now uh, Carmona with his ESR model uh, and with the cross section, as a description which is based on a PV DSR. Well, that's a different thing now because now the motivation comes from the experimental crisis. And of course, as I said, the Planck scale, there are so many arguments that point to the Planck scale, but they're all semi-holistic arguments. And I, I always stress, I did it also today, that that is on the one end, we cannot throw it away just because we don't like it. But when we have a meaningful experimental crisis that might need a lower scale, we shouldn't be scared to do it. So I'm totally in favor of that. Surely is challenging because changing relativity, changing properties of space time, even if you don't change relativity, is a very strong change of paradigm. So one thing is to put it at the Planck scale. Then it's easy to imagine that it will not affect physics that we know. If you start putting at the PV scale, I would be double safe to check that it doesn't screw up something else, yeah. right? Yeah. Because you might fix the experimental situation which is arising with the lasso data, but then you discover that, uh, I don't know, the atom, the atom, the hydrogen atom doesn't exist anymore. I'm just joking, I mean, something, uh, so to have it at PV scares me, quote unquote, I'm not scared of anything, but it seemed to me a, a big step. But I, 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 I thank you for your question and I totally agree. And your question helps me to, to make my point clear. For exploration in the dark, at least let's have the plug scale sensitivity. Otherwise we will fund everything. I mean, there will not be enough money uh, for exploration for studies based on an emerging experimental crisis, of course, those have priority anyway, even if the scale is not what some heuristic arguments suggest it should be. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> are there any more questions? Because we are kind of running out of time and we can be actually switched off by the organizers of the Marcy Grossman any minute now, but we can try one more question if there is any. All right, uh, so no questions at this time. And I think it's time for us to say goodbye to each other. I, I, I think it was a great session as 
usual. As always, this quantum gravity phenomenology sessions are really great. So let's hope we meet in three years on the Marcel Grossman 17. Thank I you, Yurek. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you, Yurek. Thank you so okay. much. Okay, ciao, Johnny. And ciao. I see you on Monday. Ciao, everybody. Okay. Bye. Thank you, bye. Bye. Thank you, bye-bye. Thank you for this session. It was very interesting. Goodbye.